Being appointed to housing for CPC? No, the yeah, yeah housing trustee. Because we never, we're in, we're looking into that because I never remember CPC having the authority to do that. It was that yeah. everybody could be, you know, like somebody from housing would be appointed to CPC, someone from recreation to CPC, but not CPC to other committees. Why? That was never done. Well, that's what we're now. well we're looking into it that's why it's not on the on the agenda yeah. that's that's why it's not on the agenda because we because we don't know that cbc has the authority to do that Say we we have to look into that whether they have the authority to do that. Yeah, that was one much juicy. I don't think they do. Um, I'll have to get up. I'll I'll ask Don. Yeah. Oh, I'm sitting in your chair. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. One more down. Um, but that's why it's not on Debbie. You were the chairman. No, 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 no. Please, no. Um, that's why it's not on. We have to look into the, the authority. As part of her presentation or separately? <laughs> Call on her. That's great. That's fine. Thanks. Well, <coughs> I'll, 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 I'll text you and let you know. I'll keep you posted, but that's what we're looking into. We don't think CPC has the authority to do that. They don't. I don't admit it often. I think housing appoints a thousand. Housing. Okay. 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 Yeah. Well, as I say, we've got to look into it, Debbie. Yeah, it is All right, we ready to go? <clears throat> Okay, welcome to the public portion of our August 2nd meeting of the Yarmouth Board of Selectmen. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, the first uh, matter is public announcements, and I'm going to call upon um, our town clerk to um, make an announcement as to some changes in voting locations for the uh, upcoming primary uh, in September and also in the um, November election. Good evening, Mary Maslowski, town clerk. Thank you for uh, the time this evening. Um, first, we just want to put out a friendly reminder that the first election this fall is um, Tuesday, September 6th. It is the day after the holiday weekend. So um, for that reason, uh, we will be, uh, we are already sending out our, our vote by mail applications and uh, they have been sent by the state. We have been receiving them. We've probably got about 4,000 back to date, ballots will start being mailed the end of this week. So if people have sent in their um, their applications, we just want to give them a heads up that they will start going out the end of this week. The first batch, uh, the next batch will probably take another week to go out. So um, just want to make people aware that we have started that process and it will be continuing throughout uh, the early voting timeframe. Um, as a reminder to everyone, all Pre all precincts with the exception of precinct one, the people that vote at 
the uh, First Congregational Church on 6A and Precinct 7, which are the folks that vote at um, Kings Highway at the uh, Kingsway. Kingsway Golf Course. Um, everyone else, including Precinct 3, which is new, will be voting at the Yarmouth Senior Center. So that will be Precincts 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, and 8A. So all will be voting in the ballroom at the Yarmouth Senior Center for the uh, September primary and for the November general election. So we will be um, sending out friendly reminders to the people in Precinct 3 um, who will be voting there for the first time for this election. Uh, we will also be doing the um, signboards and a robocall to remind people of their polling locations. But we would also let people know that because of the re-precincting, a lot of people did change precincts as well as changing polling locations. So if anybody has any questions, you can call our office. We're happy to look it up for you and confirm where you are registered and where you are scheduled to vote or you can go on to the Secretary of State's website, which at their elections division, there is a section that allows you to look up your voter registration and it will automatically tell you which, what your polling location is in the town of Yarmouth. So I wanna make people aware of those, those items in case they have questions, but we are always available to answer any. Um, and then just as a announcement, I just wanna point out that in the calendar that I, elections calendar that I had handed out to you, there is a typo at the bottom of the first page, which says the last time to vote absentee in person for the jo November general election. That should say Monday, November 7th, not Tuesday, November 7th. So we will make that correction and get corrected um, calendars out to all of you. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you. What, what we're gonna, we hope to do is under public announcements is to repeat this message so that people um, know that there are going to be changes in, in the voting locations. Either Mary will be here to make them or Bob or, or I will. But just to um, summarize, there will not be any voting here at Yarmouth Town Hall. On election day. On election day, there won't be any voting at the um, Board of Realtors um, location. Um, and except for the precinct one, which is the congregational church, Correct. and precinct seven, which is um, Kingsway. Kingsway, all other precincts will be voting at the senior center, correct? Correct, absolutely right. correct. And we have to get that word out because it's very important. I know there's, there's some people that got sent to different mm -hmm. places last time that weren't too happy about it. And we, we hope to improve on that um, not pointing any fingers at anybody. It's just people are creatures of habit. And if somebody voted for 30 years at a certain place, that's Absolutely. where their instincts take them. And we also day, found so. that a lot of it happened because some people changed precincts and they didn't realize they we're changed We're going to keep on public announcements right up to the primary. We're going to keep letting people know this. And hopefully when these sessions get broadcast, people will see them and um, they can call your office and get more information as well. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mary, I have one question. Yes. All the pre-voting happens where? The in-person early voting will happen here in this room. So we will, that will start on for the September primary. It starts Saturday, August 27th. So we will have six hours on Saturday, August 27th here, and we will go every day during working hours, so 8.30 to 4.30 that entire week. The state has mandated that we have one week of in-person early voting before the September primaries for state elections and two weeks of in-person early voting before the general elections. Now, if somebody gets a mail-in ballot, mm -hmm. Mary, they can still elect to vote in person, correct? So they can as long as they have not cast that ballot. Correct. So if they, if they. Yeah, I'm not <laughs> suggesting they correct. do it twice. No, nope, correct. Go but what we found in 2020, that was a lot of people came and handed in their mail-in ballot to us for in-person early voting. And they either voted, they either wanted to vote at their polling location on election day, or they wanted to vote here in person. So uh, that's additional steps for us, obviously. So if, if people everyone in the state was mandated to get a vote by mail application 
by the state legislature as a part of the votes act. So if someone, if a registered voter in Massachusetts did not have an absentee ballot application on file in the voter registration system before a certain date in July, they were uh, automatically put on the list to get the vote by mail card. So if people want to vote by mail and they would like a mailed in ballot, send it in to us. I would say, I'll take the opportunity to say if you're an unenrolled voter and you want a September primary ballot, please let us know which ballot you want because without that on the application, we cannot send out a ballot. Right. But other than that, if you do not want to vote um, by mail, you certainly do not have to return that card. That is the convenience that the state legislature has mandated that the Secretary of State's office do to encourage people. And that'll um, be ongoing, won't it? It is ongoing and it is, it's a permanent all change. All future elections. All future state elections, correct. Right. State right. and federal elections. So. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, public comment. Does anyone want to veto? Vita Morris. Uh, I noticed in the uh, packet for tonight's agenda, uh, there is uh, something we're having to do with the wastewater project. And uh, uh, in the packet, I noticed that uh, the CDM Smith company seems to be uh, uh, continuing as the consultant or uh, whatever their uh, title is. And uh, I wonder who the uh, actual person is. Uh, also, but I thought that at some point uh, there was a decision made to conduct a, uh, uh, a some kind of a search uh, to see if uh, the, that group would be replaced by somebody new, in other words. And uh, I wonder what happened to that. And since uh, uh, Jeff is around here, I, I, I wonder if he would enlighten us. Where's Jeff? Oh, there he is. Are we answering questions? Does, does Jeff want to address that? I don't know. Is it, I don't want to put you on the spot, Jeff. Were you motioning that you wanted to respond to that? Uh, Mr. Chair, I can very briefly. Uh, there was a request for qualifications process for designer of both our collection and, and uh, treatment facility. Uh, we had multiple responses. There was a team that was put together to evaluate those. And uh, CDM Smith was recommended and this board took action to um, uh, appoint them as our designer of record. I, I think it's also important to point out that in conjunction with that process, we had a second RFP to bring on board a completely independent engineering firm as our owner's project manager to review um, all of the technical details and coordinate that project. So um, the, the, the CDM Smith firm um, is now ensconced in, in their role as providing some specific design services, but there's an additional uh, firm of Wright Pierce that's overseeing the project management on the whole project. So it's, um, there were some pretty significant changes in the overall team. No, I, I guess I misunderstood how the, the, the process was going to work because uh, uh, Jeff just said that there was some group that was appointed by, I guess, this board or somebody to, to just review, I guess, uh, what uh, the Point of uh, order, Smith Mr. Company. Chairman, point of order, please. Um, if there's an interest in putting this item on the agenda, then I would recommend it go through the normal process. We really can't deliberate and have a discussion about this topic Without it being all on all the I agenda. want to know is what exactly and I'm happened. suggesting that that conversation be held separately with you and Mr. Colby while we can finish our business. We're not supposed to be having a deliberation and a conversation without items that are specifically on the agenda. Uh, I, I, I find that very our meetings go on long enough. Okay. Can you finish your comment? Uh, we can't. We just, can't have an ongoing. Because, we can't uh, have an ongoing dialogue about it. But that's you, that's that's something that I kept bringing up all the time, and uh, I thought it was time to uh, uh, maybe jettison uh, certainly the uh, uh, consultant himself. Uh, it's somebody that uh, the uh, uh, Harwich uh, town did just that during the uh, even the three town group, uh, as I remember correctly. You know. And I thought maybe somebody new should take a look at this this whole project. And obviously that wasn't done. I, I, I misunderstood 
what was going to be done. I thought uh, that they were, you were going to appoint a, a group that, or, or no, just uh, actually look for new uh, consultants. That's not what happened. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? Okay. We we'll go on to our next item. We had a um, very productive and extended um, executive session with Chief Russ Stevens, who is Public Safety Consultants, LLC. That's his firm. They evaluate um, and have evaluated for us in, in this instance, um, three internal candidates for the position of police chief. And um, while we can't get into the specifics of um, our discussions in executive session, we've asked the chief and he has graciously agreed to remain and address in a general sense for the public um, what that process is. And um, do you have any um, preliminary remarks you want to make, Bob, before I go to the chief? Just to let folks know that we've been um, preparing and um, carrying out the recruitment process for our new chief of police, that Chief Fredrickson will be retiring as of um, the end of October 2022. And the, um, the firm of public safety consultants was brought in to assist the town in evaluating um, all of the technical requirements of the position and uh, Chief Stevens is with us this evening to give us a, a little briefing on what his findings were. So I'd like to turn it over to Chief Stevens. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, board members. Um, thank you for allowing me to be here today and, and speak with you and the residents of Yarmouth. So Public Safety Consultants is a independent company not associated with any state, local, or federal entity. Um, we're a private company. Uh, we've been in business for over 15 years. We've done over 400 assessments in numerous ranks for police and fire, both civil service and non-civil service departments. So we were hired and contracted to work with the town to review and examine candidates to ensure that Yarmouth has viable candidates for police chief. And um, there are some towns that have to go outside and there are for police chiefs for candidates. And I'm happy to report after, after doing a extensive review, uh, you have viable candidates inside up to this point that I, that I see you have viable candidates inside for this position. How do we come to that? In order to come to that, uh, we reviewed examinate, we review uh, candidates to include their resumes. Uh, we review your job description. Um, we make sure the resumes fit the job description. We created a job announcement with the help of your human resources director. We post per requirements of the town, the job description and the job announcement and the minimum requirements of, of the job itself. Every job and for the your police department and specifically your chief has minimum requirements. We have to make sure that this, these candidates meet those minimum requirements before they can move forward in the process, which they did. We then create, we then do a dive into the town. We look at the town. Uh, we examine the uniqueness of Yarmouth, the uniqueness of the police department. Every town, every police department is different. Uh, what happens in each town is different. What happens with the police department is different. We also look for best practices. We create questions. We held an oral board examination with each one of your three candidates after they met the requirements, after the resume review. We did that actually right down in here. Your town administrator was present for that as with your human resource director was present for that as well. We speak to all three of your candidates. We ask pointed questions. We ask hypothetical questions. We ask questions on social justice, budgeting, accreditation, various questions that are unique to your town uh, to see how their responses are. So I am happy to report you do have three viable candidates. They do meet minimum requirements and they do, their answers were consistent with best practices of, of the policing culture or of the policing of today's world of policing, which was nice to see. Um, the Yarmouth Police Department, the, the next step as we, we discussed for the board is bringing your candidates forth in front of you. 
um, and as well as being in forth in front of the townspeople for a second interview, a second round of interviews. We still have a little bit of preliminary work we're going to do behind the scenes to look into, do a little deeper dive in each one of your candidates. And then my suggestion to the town administrator would bring to be, bring the candidates back to you for an interview in front of the board itself. Okay, thank you. Uh, our, um, our interviews will be next Tuesday. Um, the meeting will be devoted wholly to that process. We'll be interviewing at 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, and 7 o'clock. The interviews are open to the public if anybody wishes. Um, our consultant will be on board and we've invited him to participate in that process and to assist us in that process. Um, after that, um, probably not that night, but by the following meeting, we expect at least on a tentative basis to be making a decision as to who the next police chief will be. Um, I, I would like you to comment just on a couple of other points for the sake of the public. We have been you know, um, advised of, of a lot more information, obviously. But if you could tell them a little bit about your experience as a police chief, and if you could also tell them about the objectivity of the scoring. So with the scoring, Mr. Chairman, what we do is each one of the candidates, are not they're not scored against each other. They're scored against we examine each one of the candidates separately. It's not a competition amongst them. It's do they have, we look at what we look for as KSAPs, we call them KSAPs, knowledge, skills, ability, and personal traits. There are certain dimensions that we weight each one of the candidates on, such as oral communication skills, judgment, ethics, interpersonal relations, adaptability. Those are just some of those, the scoring criteria that we use for each one of the candidates. Um, each one of your candidates, when we interview them, we're able to show were met best practices. Um, they have each one of your candidates has master's degrees. So we were able to look at each one of your candidates individually, not compare them against each other, which is the proper way to do it. You don't, you're not, it's not a competition right now amongst themselves. The competition is, is only on themselves. You compare themselves against them. And do they have the knowledge, skills, abilities, and personal traits to do the job in today's world of policing? Policing has changed. And and like I explained to you earlier, um, we've been doing this for 15 years. I have been on, on the other side of the table. I was part of an assessment center when I got my job. And it's very important that we find the right person. We bring forth the right people for you. Um, so we do a detailed, after that interview, we did a detailed report, which, is, which gave the ranking of each one of your candidates. That's just for the assessment. That's not the process. That's just the assessment that we did is only part of the process. Uh, that's just one element of the process. Coming in front of you as, as a board, that's the second element in this process as well. And you feel that based on that assessment, each of these candidates is qualified to be a police chief in this town. I do. You have candidates, two candidates that have 30 years experience. You have one in just Yarmouth and you have one candidate that's got 17 years experience. Um, you have candidate that is a deputy chief. You have a Q who has budget experience, um, who's been a lieutenant as both a patrol, a patrol lieutenant, as well as an invest, investigatory lieutenant. You have your second candidates, 30 years experience, patrol lieutenant and investigatory lieutenant. And then you have another candidate who's got 17 years, who was a patrol lieutenant. All of them have master's degrees from accredited colleges, either with, either in public, um, uh, public safety or criminal justice, public administration, excuse me, or mm -hmm. criminal justice. One has a master's in public administration and the others in two, I think, are in criminal justice. Correct. All right, I don't have anything further. I think that um, you've given us a good overview for the benefit of the public. I invite the public to um, attend if they wish or watch the videos of, of the interview process. And uh, we look forward to working with you, Chief, towards making the best decision we can for the people of the town of Yarmouth. And we thank you for your services so far and those yet to come. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure coming here. Thank you. And I appreciate your time. Yep. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, sir. Okay. We have a licensing matter here for the 908 Bistro, 908 Route 28 South Yarmouth. I did review that material uh, earlier. 
Good evening. Hi. Do you want to just introduce yourselves for the record? My name is Russell Johnson. And I'm Lindsay Johnson. Okay. I want you to try to speak loudly and speak into the microphones, okay? So everybody can hear you. This is not a painful process. Mic check. Um, so what we do is I have to read the legal notice into the record. Okay. And then um, you can just tell us a little bit about what you want to do here. Um, I have read all the materials and then we'll take a vote. On, uh, we'll, a we'll ask if there's anybody in the public that wants to be heard and then we'll take a vote, okay? So the Yarm here's a notice. The Yarmouth Board of Selectmen acting as the local licensing authority has received an application for a transfer of an annual all alcohol restaurant license. The license is being transferred from TNT Family Enterprises Inc. doing business as Ropes End Family Restaurant, Thomas Nicanello manager to 908 Bistro Inc. DBA 908 Bistro. Vercel, is that how you say your first name? Yes, Vercel? Sir. Yep. Vercel Johnson manager. The premise located at 908 Route 28 South Yarmouth is a single floor building with four rooms, dining room, kitchen, and two bathrooms. There's also a full enclosed deck accessible only from inside the premises. Hearing will be held on Tuesday, August 2nd, 2022 at Town Hall 1146 Route 28 South Yarmouth. The selectmen's meeting begins at 6 p.m. Written comments will be accepted until 4.30 Friday, July 29th, 2022 in the Administrator's Office at Town Hall. It can be submitted electronically to public comment at yarmouth.ma.us. Verbal comments will be accepted at the hearing. Do we get any um, comments, Bob, either way on this? Any public input? I, no, we did not. We no. did not, okay. So why don't you tell us a little bit, this, as I understand this, you, they're not buying the, the business or the, you're, you're leasing it, correct? Yes, sir. And that's what we're doing. We're transferring the license under a leasehold arrangement. Yes, sir. Okay. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your background, what you want to do, and um, we'll see if the board has any questions for you. Well, we started in the restaurant business. I myself started 12 years ago. My wife started a few years before me. Um, I was a dishwasher to executive chef, now to restaurant owner. Um, this location here is part of the whole TNT facility that's there, the Skull Island Golf Course. There's an ice cream place, Route 28 Diner. So we want to add like a nice little family restaurant. Um, unfortunately, people don't go down unless they can drink. So we would like to get the current license transferred over. Um, currently, we're operating from 3 to 10 and 12 to 10 on the weekends. Um, we do not see that changing in the foreseeable future. Um, anything else? Did, okay. Um, you met with Sergeant Hennessy, I see. Yes, in the we police did. police department. His mm -hmm. checklist is there. He went over all of the rules and regulations with you. I noticed that you have a lot of experience in restaurants, but not with alcohol service, correct? No, not with alcohol service. Okay, so you got to be careful, right? Yes. The sir. thing you got to do is check IDs. You got to make sure minors don't uh, get served alcohol, and you can't serve intoxicated people. That's another thing you got to be uh, watch out for. There's other yes, things sir. too, but those are the main ones. Two big yeah. items you want to be careful about. Um, there is a mandatory. Uh, um, alcohol seminar every year. It's got to be done every two years. Did Sergeant Hennessy talk to you about that? Yes, sir. Okay, it's too late for this year, but you want to next May, June, somewhere around there, you want to be on the lookout for that. And, they, and, and that's to protect you so that you're updated and, and everybody, there's a lot of people there and they, I, I usually go and attend just to promote, you know, um, support the, the program and, and to keep up myself. So, um, and you're both TIP certified, right? Yes, sir. I see that. Um, so everything looks good as far as I'm concerned. Is, uh, is there anyone in the public that wants to speak on this? Yes, Tom Nicanello. Good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman, Stock Board. Tom Nicanello from the very historic village of Bass River in this old town of Yarmouth. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, we have a, a couple here uh, in front of you this evening that's been waiting for this for a very long time. This is one of their biggest dreams is to own their own restaurant. 
Uh, these folks live right here in town. They have three wonderful, adorable children, and they want to make. Oops, I'm sorry, four. four. You well, missed one. They just snuck in. I don't know. <laughs> they, they, they had one since the last time they talked to you. They don't know. <laughs> Possibility, even without any alcohol. But anyway, <laughs> um, this is uh, something that we're all excited about, uh, having a, um, a business owner living right here in town and to uh, to be part of the young crowd, right? I mean, as you see, over the years, we've dropped down in our commercial tax rate. we at the very bottom of the barrel right now. And uh, with Mr. Colby's help and all your help, water commissioners, sewer commissioners, we're going to be bouncing that commercial tax rate right back up in a matter of no time. So um, with that, I just like to endorse these people. These are great people. I've known them for a little while now, and uh, I am there in full support all the time with them, whatever they need. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tom. Anyone else? Thank you very much, Tom. Okay, I'm going to go to the board to see if they have any questions. I'm going to start with Selectman Forrest. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have no questions. I, I support the application. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Just one quick question. Maybe I misheard it, but uh, what are the hours for the um, the license that you're looking for? Well, on the license itself, it says 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. on the weekdays, and then 1 a.m. Yeah, 1 a.m. and then on Sundays it ends at 12 a.m. But that's that's what we're looking for. But our business hours, which we you're looking for, the same as what's right there now. Right. Tom, those are the hours. Okay, thank you. So this is just a transfer, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, thank you for your question, Dan. Dorcas? No questions, thank you. I uh, support your- thank Peter? You. Thank you. No, no questions. Um, I met you before because I spent a lot of time at Finizzi's. Oh, I <laughs> thank you, sir. I, I, have, I have no questions. Um, it's nice to see young people that are excited about starting a business and uh, um, I'm ready to take a motion to approve the transfer. Mr. Chairman, uh, would it be advisable to uh, close, make a motion to close the public We can hearing? close the public portion of the hearing, yeah, okay. Um, I moved. Is there a second on that? Second. second. Okay, we need a roll call, right? Because this is hybrid. Um, well, we're all here, so you're I think. all here, so you don't you don't really need a roll call. Roll okay, call. only if I have an absence. So all those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Now, do we have a, a motion on the underlying application? So moved. We have a second. Second. All right, we have a motion to approve the transfer um, according to the same hours that are on the existing license. Um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So that passes unanimously. And we wish you the best of luck. Thank you. And, Thank uh, you guys very much. It's, it's Thank nice you. to see young people being that industrious and ambitious and excited about their own business. Thank you very much. I hope to see other guys for dinner. <laughs> okay. Town clerk update on election matters and on the election warrant, which we have to talk about. Now, the town clerk just gave us a... Um, a brief um, presentation uh, on the um, polling locations and the um, primary in November election, but we have to talk further on on this and discuss the uh, upcoming election warrant. Good evening again for the record, Mary Maslowski, the town clerk. Uh, in your packets, you had a letter from me that summarized a couple of the new issues with the Votes Act, including in-person early voting and vote by mail which I think we addressed in public comment. Although if you have additional questions, I'm happy to address them. Um, one of the changes that the Votes Act made was requiring that your board now take a vote to assign a minimum number of police officers to each polling location. Uh, as you all are aware, we have always had police officers assigned to the polling locations and traditionally that's been done by the police chief in consultation with the town clerk. So I did speak with Chief Fredrickson uh, to see if he was amenable to having you folks refer it back to him to be able to continue to make those assignments. Uh, it will give him greater flexibility so that he can assign um, on the for the election days and for in-person early voting. Uh, we've traditionally done it. It's just that the new votes act now calls for the board of selectmen to take um, a vote to do the same thing that we've traditionally always done. 
without the direction. So I'm happy to answer any questions you have on that if you have as any. the um, as the town clerk traditionally, even though in in theory they're consulting with the police. Do they in fact do that? So typically what we do is we make the request for how many detail officers we want and when when we want them. So uh, since I've been here, I've always asked for police officers to staff our early in-person early voting sessions um, to make sure that there is a presence on site to protect the ballots. And we've also always had at least a one police officer for each precinct. When we had all separate precincts, we did have uh, three police officers at the senior center last for the um, last May for the town election. So we had two people inside, one person outside, and they rotated throughout the day. And they're there just to uh, make sure that they always open and close the ballot boxes. They're always present when that happens. It's to protect the ballots and to protect our election workers. So we've okay. traditionally always um, had them on site. Does anyone else that, uh, before Mary goes on, have any questions? Are you soliciting questions from the board, Mr. Chairman? I, I do. Um, my question is that you're looking for two votes from the board. Correct. Tonight, one separate vote on the police detail assignments and Correct. delegating that authority to the chief. And then the second vote would be on approving the warrants. Correct. Did you want to go over the warrant with us? I certainly can. And I would just recommend we just, add, once you're done with your presentation, we just do one motion with the necessary approvals, if that's okay. So you'll find the, the warrant in your packet. It, this is the standard form of warrant that we use for uh, state elections, just calling the constables to, um, to notify the public of the September 6th primary. Uh, as you can see from it, it lists out each of the precincts, each of the polling locations, and each office that is on our ballots. As a reminder, we have four ballots on the September primary, a Democrat and a Republican ballot, for precincts one through four, precinct seven and precinct eight, and then a separate ballot for precincts five, six, and eight A. That is because we have two state representative districts within the town of Yarmouth. So there are essentially four ballots for this year's state primary. So unless there are any questions, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to move that we um, approve the uh, election warrants as presented by the town clerk and that we delegate as a board to uh, the chief of police, Chief Fredrickson, the uh, authority to make decisions in consultation with the town clerk on police details to cover um, the elections. Chairman Stone, uh, yes. um, the town clerk has provided very specific language that she needs on, on the very last page of the memo. So. So then I will uh, recommend that we adopt the, uh, my motion is as written by the uh, the town clerk. Why don't you read your motion read it just, uh, just for sake of uh, caution. So the motion reads, uh, the Board of Selectmen hereby delegates its authority given under chapter 92, section 72 of the acts of 2022 to detail a sufficient number of police officers or constables for each building that contains the polling places for one or more precincts at every election therein to preserve order and to protect the election officers and supervisors from interference with their duties and to aid in enforcing the laws related to elections to the chief of police in consultation with the town clerk. Okay, stop there just for a minute. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? That passes unanimously. Can you proceed with the second part Mr. of the Chair, selectmen? Mr. Chair, yes, I move that the Board of Selectmen adopt the warrant for September 6, 2022, state primary, and direct the town clerk to have said warrant duly advertised and posted in accordance with the charter and the bylaws of the town of Yarmouth and the laws of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I have a second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? That passes unanimously. Both motions pass unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. And we'll be back for future public announcements. Yes, if you wish. we got it. We got to get the public squared away on this stuff. 
All right, discussion and approval of the state revolving fund. Uh, wastewater phase one, water main replacements relating to wastewater phase one, lead water service action plan, PFAS treatment, and Route 6A water main project. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Jeff Colby, Public Works Director. I'd like to have some introductory comments about this uh, generally, but it's, it's really good news uh, that we have five uh, SRF application requests before you tonight. Uh, you'll get a little detail on, on each one, and we have the full team here to uh, answer any questions or support these um, as necessary. Uh, the first one relative to wastewater uh, phase one, We've got uh, Dave Young and Kara Johnson from CDM Smith to walk you through a brief presentation. There's a little more detail in this presentation about the process relative to uh, SRF and, and what that looks like, but uh, just in a real um, high level sense, uh, it's a state revolving fund. It's uh, the, the step that we're looking for permission from the board to file is by the due date of August 12th to file the project evaluation form. And hopefully that will get us on the intended use plan for next year for these projects. Uh, each one of these projects is a little bit different in the sense of how uh, SRF approaches them. Uh, there are two different tracks. There's a drinking water track and a clean water track. So we can go into a little bit more detail as we present each project to you and answer any questions you might have. Uh, some of them will be eligible for uh, subsidies, both state and federal subsidies. So that's why it's so important to get these projects in the pipeline for that. Uh, and in one particular case, uh, there's a uh, complete uh, loan forgiveness type of program associated with that you'll hear about in a little while. So it's good news that we have projects in the pipeline and uh, lining up for uh, federal or state funds that might be available. Uh, certainly the state revolving fund, the, the primary, traditionally the primary purpose is a low interest loan program. So we're talking about uh, projects that could be eligible for a 2% or even a 0% uh, loan, uh, much better, of course, percentage rate than the town could get by doing these projects separately. So that's just a high level overview. Again, we're looking for permission from the board to file these applications and to have Bob sign on your behalf um, when they're ready before the uh, August 12th uh, filing deadline. I believe this is your last meeting before that deadline. We are mm -hmm. taking general business, so that's why we're looking for approval for these tonight. Uh, with that said, we do have the full team here. Uh, we've got uh, Kleinfelder, our, our water consultant. We'll talk about those particular applications. Uh, we have uh, Lou Ragazzino, who's our owner's project manager that's here tonight for the wastewater project, and he's available to answer any questions you might have. Uh, we have Lori Rizal, our water and wastewater superintendent here as well as the chairman of our Water Resource Advisory Committee that's here tonight to uh, answer and support uh, these projects. Uh, so with that said, the first one is uh, wastewater, and this is the phase one of our wastewater program. You've heard um, a lot about this project. You will certainly hear a lot about it uh, leading up to the 2023 town meeting when we'll be asking for funding, but the first step in that process is to file for this application. So with that said, I'll turn it over to the team from CDM Smith to walk you through that uh, that project. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, David Young from CDM Smith with Kara Johnston, also from CDM Smith. Uh, we have uh, a few slides just to walk you through the what's known as the clean water SRF program, but this is where wastewater projects are funded. Uh, you'll hear about the drinking water one later for your water projects. Try to switch on the side. Now I know why you brought others with you. Yes, definitely. <laughs> you click the button. Don't look to me for help with that stuff. <laughs> so just to refresh everyone's memory, we're here to talk about the phase one wastewater program, which is shown in the tan color here. Um, we're filing what's known as one project evaluation form, but uh, it's actually currently, uh, to about a week ago, six contracts that we're proposing uh, to um, put forth in that. And the six are 
the treatment plant, which is located right in this location, that would be contract one. Uh, contract right. two would be over in this area along Route 28, which is not part of a mass start project. Contract three would be the other portion of that in South Shore Drive. Uh, David, could you hold on one second? The people at home can't can't see the anything the, the light. The, so, Bill, if you could if you could. The mouse shows up at the bottom screen. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, I didn't mean I didn't mean to interrupt. Great, no problem. Uh, we are in the process of getting a uh, up-to-date map that will be part of the SRF. We'll make sure that gets posted on the town's website too. But again, contract one would be the treatment plant, which would be located here. Uh, contract two uh, would be over in this area along Route 28, Old Main Street, which is not part of any of your Mass Department of Transportation projects. Uh, contract three would be that other remaining portion and the South Shore Drive. The reason those are divided is that flow goes to the west. This flow would go directly up to the treatment plant. Contract four is a Mass Department of Transportation project, which is at North Main Street, Old Main Street, Route 28 intersection, and that's combined with the Bass River Bridge project. And then contract five would be the contract that has been talked about for a long time. <laughs> that would be the Mass Dot project from Parker's River Bridge all the way over to the Barnstable line. And contract six would be any work along that stretch that would not be part of the MassDOT project. Uh, what I mean by that is the pumping stations and any of the side roads that may be picked up with that. So if you look then to this uh, brief table, you'll see that we've put together a timeline uh, for when we believe uh, the work would go out for uh, construction start and then completion. And this falls within the state revolving fund uh, timelines that are required. So again, you'll see on the top, the WRF is the water resource recovery facility or the treatment facility. Uh, contract two, as I indicated, uh, two and three are the east of Parker's River. And then four is that intersection uh, at Old North Main Street uh, and then we go back to the west with contracts five and six on Route 28. Now, part of the reason we're trying to do uh, two and three is ahead of the other ones so that Route 28 isn't being constructed all at the same time. So we're trying to get that ahead of the curve there. So that's reflected in the schedule you see. Uh, this, I realize, is a little bit difficult to read. Uh, hopefully you can see it a little better on your computer screen. Uh, this we took from a presentation you actually had directly from the uh, state revolving fund uh, folks at DEP and the trust uh, back on, uh, I believe it was February of 2020. Uh, so we took it and updated these dates to the current proposed schedule. Um, as you can see where the first one is right here. This is where we're filing uh, this August 12th the project evaluation form uh, that starts you into the process. Uh, we've had discussions with the state and they want the whole program put into that one uh, evaluation form. Um, so all those- When you say the whole program, you mean all of those all phases those that you mentioned? Yes. Okay. Um, versus sometimes in the past, they've looked to divide things up and this mm -hmm. and that, but uh, to get you the highest rating and hopefully get you into that 0% interest loan program, they want it all put in for one evaluation package. So then you move into, uh, they do the evaluation process during this time frame, and around the end of the year, uh, January, they will issue what's known as an intended use plan. That means they've rated all the projects they've received uh, in this current cycle year. And you will find out where you stand uh, in that process, presuming you will be on that list. Uh, then, you will need to, and this is one of your key milestones to remember out of this whole presentation, next Springs Town meeting, you will need to fund the whole cost of the program. So that's a key marker because you have to have that in place by June 30 of 2023. So the whole program we're asking for that whole amount, you will need to fund that at town meeting next spring. And then you walk through uh, there's just different processes that we'll have to do 
We'll file the application no later than October of 2023, but we currently have it in the schedule for August of 2023. Uh, then there are other different commitment dates. You'll start to see the loan commitment to you. That's when you'll know for sure whether you've qualified for 0% interest or not. Uh, and then they will uh, review the applications, issue you an approval to advertise. Uh, that's when we go out to bid. Uh, and then um, they'll start to get uh, loan schedules depending on when those uh, different con contracts are bid. But the second key date is this June one. And that means that as of June 30th, 2024, you need to have awarded those six contracts. So there's a one year process there from when you have to have all your projects funded at the local level, then we need to get them all out to bid and get them all awarded within that next year. And then there's, you sign the loans and then ultimately, depending on where you are, roughly about 50% through on the construction process is when you actually start to then get the loan repayment schedule and would start to um, repay the loans at those rates that they've given you. And that's when uh, you get your loans too. That's when, as uh, Jeff Kobe mentioned, you will find out about any potential uh, principal forgiveness that you would qualify for. That changes each year, depending on how much money they get, uh, what tier they put the town of Yarmouth in, in terms of per capita income, which they update on an annual basis. Um, so all those things would come about, but the two keys are, you need to have all your funding in place by June 30th, 2023 and we need to get all the contracts awarded by June the, that following June 2024. So with that I'd like to ask Kara to uh, talk about some other sort of logistical things along the way. David before you move on what does it mean to be fully funded because we won't know if we have the loans approved yet. Um, you need to um, you know, in the notice of project change, you had a program cost of 162 million. That because of cost increases has gone up. We're in the process of trying to project what that is, but say it with 162, you would have needed to pass town meeting articles that says you've funded 162 million. Irrespective that we don't know whether we're gonna get the loans and at what rates. Well, no, you would know um, whether they're funding you and you find that out when you get on the intended use plan. Oh, okay, okay. Yes. question. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'll be touching on some of the next steps that will happen as part of this SRF process. So one of the big items is ensuring that the town gets 0% interest for this project in order to save the most amount of money as we can. There are five key components in order to obtain that 0% interest loan. The first is that the project is for nutrient reduction. And that's, of course, why we're all here tonight for this project is to reduce the nitrogen. So we are certainly doing that. The second is that DEP has no um, orders on the town, no violations, and that's currently the case. The third is that the town has a certificate from MEPA for the project. The town has the approved 2011 CWMP, most recently submitted a no notice of project change and has the certificate from MEPA for that part of the project. And we will be submitting the supplemental environmental impact report next month. Um, and we'll receive another certificate for that. So by the time that the SRF application and PEF application goes in, I should say, um, that will certainly be achieved. The fourth aspect is that the plan is consistent with the 208 plan. Um, we receive positive comments from the Cape Cod Commission as part of the MEPA review process, and uh, we will be formally submitting the full application to them uh, in the next month or so. And the final piece is land use controls. So DEP wants to make sure that the town has flow neutral land use controls, meaning that the town has prepared um, and projected what they expect for wastewater flows to make sure that they're not going to significantly increase those in the future. So we've been working with Jeff and the RAC and town staff in order to um, project what those flows might be, and we'll be working to finalize the land use controls with the with those groups. Uh, as soon as DEP and other state agencies review those, those would then come back to you for review uh, and approval. A couple of other items um, that will come back to your group is the authority to file. 
Um, so you will need to authorize the town administrator to formally file the SRF application uh, next year to formally obtain the loan. But at this point, uh, we are just looking for support in order to finalize this first step of the application, the project evaluation form um, that just gets you on that intended use plan as we talked about tonight and doesn't necessarily um, lock the town into anything at this point. Um, so some of our other next steps, as I mentioned, uh, will be authorizing the administrator to file that application uh, over the next uh, year or so. And with that, we can take any other questions. Okay, that's right. Um, we will also be submitting a drinking water loan PEF application that Jeff touched on for work that is within the same project area that will be under the separate drinking water loan application um, that will be separate from the clean water, but will be submitted at the same time. And that's the second item on your list. So, Mr. Okay. Chairman, I don't know if you want to take each one in order or all of them together. It's really um, up to you. I think we'll stop here and talk a little bit if the board wishes to, and then we'll move on to the next one. I think that'll be the easiest thing to do. So, Mark, do you have any questions? Yes, yes I do. I think that's an excellent recommendation, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, uh, with respect um, to this, um, can you give us an idea financially what we're talking about in terms of money? for each of these projects? I mean, the schedule one, we've got a number of items, the treatment plant, phase one, A, phase one collection system, B, and so forth. What, what's just even a ballpark estimate of, because I think what, what I want people to understand is that this is a significant step forward for Yarmouth in addressing wastewater. And the filing of this application and all the paperwork is the first step in getting phase one underway and the amount of money that we're talking about is roughly what all the costs that were presented in your notice of project change and presented when you've done previous town meeting votes i uh, had the phase one program at 162.4 million okay uh, about you know 65 of that was towards collection and the rest was towards the treatment plant and effluent recharge uh, we're in the process of updating those because, as you know, costs have all gone up in the last two years. Um, and so looking at working with your owner's project manager, town staff, our cost estimating group, looking at other bids, you know, you're probably 20 plus percent higher than that right now yeah. because of what's right. happened. Um, I don't want to put a number on the table because we haven't had those final discussions, but we will be breaking that out by those six contracts. No, no, I, I understand. And that'll be projected to 2024 midpoint, midpoint of, construction, of construction right so what in terms of submitting this what do you think the odds are that we'll qualify for zero percent interest financing uh very high um you've done everything we've made sure all the check marks have been done we've been uh had a lot of good conversations with all the state dep folks the srf folks um, that's why we wanted to make sure that, you know, we were filing one PEF or two separate collection and treatment. Uh, they came back and uh, very good. Okay. That's very, very good. And when you say that DEP wants us to include everything, you mean everything with respect everything to phase, phase one, one. Yes. phase one. Okay. So that's what we're referring to when we talk about everything. Um, just as a side, Mr. Chairman, I, I just want to make it clear for those that caught the beginning of our meeting, uh, the selection process was open and competitive. This particular work went through a competitive procurement process and this firm, CDM, won the competition. They beat out the other firms that applied to do this work. So I know there was a question raised about that, but I thought maybe at this moment, it might be an appropriate time just to remind people that we've gone through that process. And that all came to the board for final approval, which we provided. Um, the only other question I have on this piece is with respect to the land use controls. Um, can you just take a few minutes and maybe this is not a question for you, David, maybe a question for somebody else, maybe Jeff could answer it. But when when do we really look at getting into the weeds and the details on the land use controls? Because they should be significant, I would imagine. Uh, I'll give it for a stab and uh, Jeff can fill in. Um, we've given a draft to the Water Resource Advisory Committee uh, probably six months ago now. Um, it's been modeled after others that we've helped other communities develop. Uh, as Kara indicated, it's really a management tool so that uh, DEP wants to make sure that, uh, you know, the 
flows that you have projected and put forth in your comprehensive wastewater management plan are managed to those numbers. Uh, that you just don't open the door and let you know, some high rise hotels or something come in, whatever it may be. Uh, and suddenly what DEP is funding for you is no longer working for you. They need something else. They want you to manage to what you've projected. And so there's a draft of that. Uh, we need to get back with the Water Resource Advisory Committee to finalize it. Um, it doesn't mean no growth. It means managed growth. Right. So uh, your economic development staff, planners, uh, the Water Resource Advisory Committee, they put a lot of effort into developing those numbers. We just need to fine tune some of the management aspects of it. We'll then send it to DEP and the State Housing Authority who have to approve them. Uh, and then it would come back to you for final approval as the uh, sewer commissioners. Okay. And that would need to be in place by the time we file the application uh, about That's a year August. from now. As a follow up, Mr. Chairman, um, I'm assuming these land use controls that we're talking about are like zoning measures and other requirements. Are they that would require town meeting action or do you think that they're exclusively within the control of the select board and the in the water commissioners the sewer commissioners authority These, because all it's doing is taking the flow that's been projected and you're managing how that flow is allocated out to certain areas i see it's got nothing to do with zoning changes or anything those flows are uh, have been projected based on your current zoning i see so that work is before the water resources advisory committee and you're going it over with them that's great thank you very much yeah just one additional question on the uh, the loans. Is there a, a cap that um, they uh, impose on towns so that you can only get this much? Because obviously the competition for these funds is pretty strong. Uh, no, that's a very good question. Um, what they do is they ask us to prepare cash flows. They're not going to give you, you know, again using that 162. They're not going to give you 162 million dollars up front. They're gonna ask, you know, all right, how do those six contracts lay out? What's the duration? What's the cash flow per year? And then they would allocate whatever is needed that first year, the second year, and they do what's called multi-year carryovers. So once they funded a contract, you would get funded for that contract. Um, with the competition increasing, we don't know whether they're going to put caps on or not. The regulations only require them to issue one third of the uh, loans that they give out at 0% interest. So there's a potential you might get a third of what you're asking for at 0% and the rest at 2.25%. That's still below what you can probably go out on the bond market for and get today, particularly with the rates going up. Um, so you're somewhere in that range. Um, Again, they've asked us to fund the whole thing. That was one of our concerns, whether they would put a cap on how much they would give you. Uh, but they know the, um, uh, the level of funding required to get this project going, and they've endorsed it. OK, thank you. Dorcas. I think my, I think my questions have been answered. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Peter. Um, uh, to follow up on what uh, Mr. Forrest had to say, the town has also hired an independent person to to if you will watch over cdm smith and and make sure that everybody keeps everything nice and clean um repayment schedule on the loans are they based on a 30 30 year term once everything is fully funded or or 25 or 20. uh they issue them at 20 but they give you the option to select 30 so most communities today are selecting for 30. It, I, it's a project that has to be done. Exactly. Mr. Chairman, do we, do we need to have a motion on item number one of phase one? Is that all the applications gonna consist of is phase one? So yes, let's, uh, let's do the motion now. I'd be happy to make a motion, Mr. Thank Chair. Uh, I move that the board, um, uh, authorize uh, town officials, CDM Smith, and the uh, our project manager to finalize the uh, SRF applications discussed tonight, and that the selectmen further authorize the town administrator to file all the necessary paperwork um, 
to uh, basically get the prop get this project uh, funded uh, with SRF funds and to sign on behalf of the town. Correct. Okay. And then, in addition to file the project evaluation form with MassDEP for clean water construction loan funds uh, that uh, will be submitted on August 12th, 2022. Second. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. Is there anything that you see that we have not included in that motion? No? All right. Um, all those in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So that passes unanimously by a 5-0 vote. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. The, so let's proceed on to the second part. Okay, excellent. This, the second one, we touched upon it just, just a moment ago, but it's the water main replacements related to phase one of the project. So I just put back up the phase one chart on the screen. <coughs> and in order to uh, deal with the utilities at the same time, uh, we have water main replacements going on along uh, the Route 28 corridor, that same kind of tan area that's shown on the screen there. And the reason why this is broken out is it's a separate application. As I mentioned before, there's the clean water, which are the wastewater project SRF process, very similar process, but separate application for the drinking water uh, SRF. Uh, water mains are technically um, eligible for those. I don't know, it's, gonna, it's not gonna score, honestly, it's not gonna score as well as a uh, wastewater project with nutrient removal components to it. Uh, but we are uh, asking to put this forward in case there are any potential state or federal uh, subsidies associated with uh, these drinking water uh, projects. And so that's why we're looking to put that uh, project forward under the SRF program. Again, it would be great to even uh, get a low interest loan for that if that's possible. So that is the reason why we're recommending that uh, process. Uh, that could be done separately with you know going out to borrow at whatever interest rate the town could get. But uh, at a minimum, if we can get a low interest loan for that uh, water main replacement component of this project, uh, that would certainly be desirable. So that's just a high level overview of that uh, water main component associated with that uh, phase one of our wastewater project and happy to answer any questions. Again, it's a separate application. Right. Process. Mr. Chair, question. What's, what is, what's the cost we're talking about, Jeff? I'm, I think I missed that. The estimate right now, and we're still refining those numbers is $11.9 million for yeah. water main replacements along Route 28. So, this, so the idea here is that while the work is going on on the sewer, collection system, any water, we, it, it's appropriate to take care of the water main work that needs to be done there. And I think everybody in town knows that we need to do a fair amount of upgrading of our water distribution system. Absolutely. So um, I'm, I'm happy to make a motion just to get the discussion sure. going. I, I, I move to authorize uh, the town administrator to file on behalf of the Board of Selectmen an application for uh, SRF loan funds for uh, phase one for the, uh, the, the water mains that uh, need to be placed on Route 28. Is that a, does that get us through? Okay. Yes. There you go. There's the motion. Do have a second? Second. Okay. Any further discussion on that? Just a quick question. The, the 11.9 million is in addition there to, to the 162, right? Just Correct. so everybody's understanding. Right. Okay. But there is a savings associated with that if we're doing it in conjunction with the Mass DOT project. So, you know, it could be less than that if we're able to coordinate with those other ongoing DOT projects. Great. Thank you. I have a follow up. I think Selectman Horgan raised an excellent question. Generally, we're accounting for all of our expenditures on the water system in our enterprise in, in a separate fund, correct? correct? So, to the extent that there are local costs, Th these are all handled through the the enterprise funding that's associated with our water system. It's not like this would be handled like, uh, you know, th through the through the property tax or some other source. That's correct. Yes, the debt repayment would be through the water special revenue fund. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, so you had that motion, and we have a second on that. There, there was a second, but I have a further question when you're ready. Um, I'm ready. You, you said if we can coordinate with Mass DOT, if is a big word. What are, you, what are your thoughts? Are they, are we, they being very 
they reticent to? Are, are they being very cooperative, at least at this point? DOT is very cooperative. We are coordinating both of the projects. I think David earlier t- talked about where those were. It is the western side of Route 28 from the Parkers River Bridge to the Barnstable Town Line is one project. And the other one is uh, that four corners, Route 28, North Main and Old Main Street and the Bass River Bridge. They're being very cooperative. The, uh, the moving target is relative to their timing and if it matches our timing. So those are things that we're working out that we talked about the schedule under item number one. And so we're committing to a schedule to make this work within that SRF program. And there is some question still on that Western part of Route 28, uh, again, from the Parkers River Bridge to the Barnesville Town Line of exactly what that schedule is. Now, I understand that you'll be getting a presentation from Mass DOT about that project at the uh, August 6th, at your August 16th meeting. And so I think a big question for them at that meeting is, what's your schedule, you know, are you going to meet our schedule and kind of pushing them along to uh, work more uh, diligently to to our schedule. They, they certainly are moving the project along and we're closely coordinating the installation of that uh, collection system and water main uh, work within their project, but their timing is still a little bit of a moving target. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, we have a motion to second. All those in favor? Second. Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next item is the, the uh, discussion and approval of locations for the roadway banner project. No, no, wait, we have we have the PFAS oh, we have remediation. PFAS. I'm sorry, plan. we have PFAS, yeah. Yeah, Mr. Chair, we have three more items on here. I was just changing Red the slides. Water service action, PFAS, and Route 6A. Okay. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, the, the next application that we are seeking to file with the State Revolving Fund Program is for the Lead Water Service Action Plan. Uh, these next two items, actually three and four, uh, differ from the first two and that we're actually on target to request funding at the fall town meeting. So you will hear more about these projects as we have article presentations before the board as we get ready and, and prepare the, the town meeting warrant for the fall. Uh, but with that said, we have the deadline the same as the others for filing by August 12th for, uh, to participate in the SRF pro- program. Uh, so with that said, I'll turn it over to our uh, water consultant, uh, Kirsten Ryan with Kleinfelder to walk us through this first one, which is the lead water service action plan. Thanks, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yep. I'm Kirsten Ryan, the senior project manager with Kleinfelder, uh, working on the water system for Yarmouth. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to talk about two water quality concerns, lead and PFAS. Um, what's a little bit different than the projects that you just heard about is Fortunately, these are priority items for the new federal infrastructure dollars. So the bipartisan infrastructure law that was signed um, recently is flowing a lot of new money down to the state SRF programs. Um, so DEP is is opened up some new sources of funding, which provide not only principal forgiveness, but also grants. So that should allow you to implement projects on a sooner timeline than some of the traditional SRF timelines that you're hearing about. So I'll talk talk through both, uh, starting with the lead. Um, just want and we've been working closely with DEP as well. They've been very cooperative and sort of helping us understand how to get um, access to funding most quickly for Yarmouth. Um, so uh, the important thing is that there have been some significant revisions to the federal lead and copper rule, which is a rule that uh, tries to minimize the effect of, of lead piping on public health. Uh, if you're familiar with Flint, Michigan, that whole story. So there's um, some three new regulation r- changes that you're going to be required to meet by t- October 2024, which sounds like a long ways away, but um, Yarmouth has about 16,000 service connections. So that's a lot of pipes. I'm not saying that they're all lead or there may be very few that are lead. What the requirement is that we need to inventory map and confirm where there are any lead service lines. Um, and the lead a service line, just to explain for the public, you have a water main going through the street. The service line is the narrow, small diameter lateral that branches off of the main to the houses. So there's a portion that's in the street. There's a portion that's on public property. Um, this SRF application for um, 100% principal forgiveness 
would allow Yarmouth to complete these three important requirements that are due October 2024. One is that inventory. So mapping all the service lines, confirming what material they're made out of, um, both the town side and the customer side is required. Developing a replacement plan for any lead service lines that are identified. And then also updating uh, lead sampling sites and procedures as part of it. Um, so this new Mass DEP, it's essentially functioning as a grant because it's a reimbursement loan with 100% principal forgiveness. Um, and that funding is now open. They opened that up July 1st. It's available on a first come first serve, serve basis. So they're really encouraging um, towns to apply now. Um, uh, applying now will you know, help you meet that October deadline. And it's gonna be a popular program. We know a lot of communities that we're working with are asking for applications to get that funding. And I just wanna uh, mention, you know, there's a note at the bottom here, but there's, there's no lead in Yarmouth's water supply. The problem is when you have uh, piping or plumbing and the corrosion levels are high, if they are high, um, it leaches lead into the water. Now Yarmouth does treat its water with a pH adjustment to minimize any corrosion. Uh, Yarmouth is fully in, in compliance with lead testing right now. Um, but that is, you know, minimizing risk means taking lead pipes out of the ground and replacing them. So just wanted to make that clarification. So just briefly what this project would involve, um, just the summary of the tasks and schedule that we're proposing. And we're working on similar projects like this for Somerville and other communities. First would be um, a records review. Obviously we want to uh, look at any maps that exist, um, data that exists, do a desktop review before we start going out and doing field, field work to minimize the amount of field work that may be needed. Um, then the inventory and mapping would be done um, between February and June roughly. And that means actually um, uh, looking at the plumbing coming into the basement of people's homes and or um, digging a very small test pit out in the street to look at where it, what the material is in the street. And we can use some statistical methods and modeling as well to help um, min maximize the uh, predictability of where lead might be so that we're not just digging holes everywhere. We can look at the desktop data first and then decide where it's more likely to go looking first. Um, so that's the inventory and mapping and then coming up with the plan. Okay, how many did we find? What is gonna be the plan for replacing lead services that we found? And what is the procedures and policies that go along with that and funding? Um, the last thing would be the sampling plan update. And throughout this whole project, we would be providing uh, public outreach and education, letting people understand what this program is, why it's needed, you know, how they can help um, with the inventories perhaps, and what they could do to help protect their health. Yeah, so that's it. So yeah, basically um, we are looking for the authorization to file the application to access this funding tonight. And again, this one, just to reiterate, was 100% uh, loan forgiveness. So while we do have to treat it uh, as a project that we anticipate to be $452,650, we expect to be fully um, uh, forgiven that amount yeah. through the SRF process. So if it's only 450000 you don't anticipate a lot of lead pipe. Well, this is we, the we don't inventory part of it. I mean, this is not the, that's not to fund replacing and removing. This uh, is the actual investigation. That's just the preliminary. Mm, I see, okay. mapping. Do we have any idea at all? I mean, just a rough idea how much lead pipe we have in the ground here? Well, can I, can, Mr. Lori, Chairman, can I just, can I just, yeah. I, I, want, I think we should clarify. We're talking about service connections, not town. My understanding is we don't have lead in any of our mains, is that correct? No, we do. Right, we don't. Have we don't. Right. right. So it's important to understand, yeah, that what we're talking about here for everybody on the board is what we're discussing are the service connections that is that and that are typically the responsibility of the homeowner. Partially. Partially. Well, and so I, that's true. In some cases, we have actually put the service lines in for some homeowners. I believe is that correct? Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to make it clear. We're not talking about water mains. Our water mains no. do not have lead issues. It's, it's the service connections between our water mains and the home. 
So That's doesn't all. that connection like run from the road to a certain location on the meter mm -hmm. as to the, whose responsibility it is? Yeah, there's a good diagram on, on the screen here of the, the service connection. It really goes from uh, the water main, you know, through the, the meter into the basement here. Uh, there could be a potential for goosenecks where there are transitions from uh, water main to the, the service or even portions of the service. We don't expect that to be the case in many locations, but we need to verify that. Yeah, the, you have to um, basically create a complete inventory that documents what the material is for each of these. And if I could just- is, is this loan forgiveness gonna be limited just to the inventory stage or is it also gonna be related to replacement? We expect to, there is gonna be significant subsidies available for actual replacement. Yes. Okay. We just won't know what, you know, what kind of project or what kind of funding that would need to be until we do the inventory. Seems to me like it'd be a pretty daunting task to locate mm -hmm. these lead connecting uh, pipes throughout the whole town of Yarmouth, wouldn't it? It's a process. That's uh, you know why it's almost half a million dollar effort. Uh, there is some physical excavation that needs to happen. Uh, and as uh, Kirsten just mentioned, we try to narrow those areas down by doing records reviews ahead of time. Again, we don't expect there to be uh, significant amounts of these, you know, kind of lead services, but that needs to be validated and reported to DEP between uh, now and October of 2024. Are most of those connections put in by private vendors? Yes. And do we have records on those installations? We do. Uh, do you want to comment on that? Yes. Laura? So for every service we have, we call them tie cards that shows where the service is. Um, not every tie card says what material the service was when it was installed. So that's where our um, kind of issue is. We don't have ex precise records for every service about what material it's made out of. So that's where we have to do the research and um, try and figure out exactly what each line is made of. Okay, any questions, Mark? Um, the, uh, the fact of the matter is, is that we probably would not be doing this without the federal government giving the states a significant amount of money. Either that or we'd be doing it with us being forced from a regulatory point of view to do it. And uh, it obviously it's, 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 it will be expensive. So I think this is terrific that um, this has been presented to us tonight that um, that we have the opportunity to pursue to what I would say realistically is grant money uh, to essentially develop this plan. I I'm with you, Mr. Chairman. I don't think we have a huge problem, but I do think obviously since we're required to do this kind of assessment that we should do it using the, the federal slash state money that's available to us um, so um, I think this is terrific that this recommendation came to us tonight. I don't think it was on our radar screen until just recently. So I think this is great. I think this is also the value of having good consultants working for the town. Uh, I commend you, Chris, Kirsten, on your, uh, your presentation. And uh, you, you probably give the most concise and brief and to the point presentations of probably anybody that comes to our board. Uh, they're very good, they're very direct and uh, keep it up. <laughs> um, but so I, I, I totally support this request. I think it's wonderful. Yeah. Just uh, do you expect to use a consultant to get this work done or a town staff? Um, oh, sorry. Yes, we plan to use Kleinfelder for this service. Okay, great. Yeah, the application, you know, asks you to identify a consultant. It doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean you're required to, but um, yeah, and, and we would be working also with a couple of other partner firms. One, uh, you know, the the project does have some uh, disadvantaged business enterprise requirements, um, min minority-owned, women-owned business. So we do our best to work with um, a couple of subconsultants on that effort. And we've already identified those partners. So from your other work, you're, you're pretty adept at tracking this kind of stuff in terms yeah, we, of- we do a lot of SRM. Knowing where to look. Well, grant programs, or yes. I'm always trying to find money for, for clients, to, especially to do the things that you're being required to do. So yeah, this is a great opportunity, this new program. And um, you know, as soon as I heard DEP start talking about it, I was 
bugging them to find out and when. It, and it how avoids when. inevitable problems down the road, too. I mean, yeah. they, they're going to happen sooner or later. Mm -hmm. uh, Dorcas? No, I don't have any questions. Thank yeah. you. Yes. Um, the, the project is, is just from the water main to the meter. It does not take into consideration the, the lead that's in the copper piping uh, the, where the pipes have been sweated together in, inside somebody's house. Correct. That is not part of the inventory. Right. Um, it, it, kind of off, off the wall. Are they changing, changing codes so that there'll be less lead in houses now? In, I don't in, think you're not allowed to use lead currently in houses. Well, I do construction or, or replacement. Okay. I'm, I do a lot of construction inspections and I still see a lot of lead connectors out there. Right. There, there is a lot of lead within older homes within right. the buildings themselves. And I don't no, think no, that I'm, they're required I, to upgrade their plumbing. Right. I'm, I'm talking about construction inspections that are done in 2022. I've seen, I've seen a lot of lead, lead, you know, pipes sweated together. So, yeah, that's why the other part of the compliance program is, is keeping the pH level of the, of the water supply elevated enough to prevent corrosion and leaching right, yeah, of any I, additional lead out. Right, yeah, the, keeping the pH level keeps the corrosion down and, and, and it keeps any of the lead that's in the sweated pipes to leach into the water, so that, that's important. Yeah, and the sampling compliance program gets at that part of it. Right. All right, do you, Thank you. Do you want a motion on this? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that we uh, endorse the proposed lead water servant action plan grant proposal and authorize the town administrator to work with uh, our DPW department to uh, file an application on behalf of the Board of Selectmen. And to sign any appropriate documents on behalf Accordingly, of the town? That would be, that's proper to add that in, yes. Do I have a second on that? Second. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? That passes unanimously. Okay, thank you very much. So we're on PFAS so next, I guess. Yes, the next item we have is PFAS. And just a, a little bit of background on this. Earlier this summer, we presented to the board uh, some of the challenges with regard to our, our water system and the wells that we have offline. Uh, Kirsten is here to give a, a brief update on that uh, as part of this uh, presentation and talk about PFAS treatment. Uh, the board asked that we come back before you with something that could be acted on uh, potentially this fall at town meeting. And this is one of those items. Uh, it is a involved project, as you'll hear about, in that there's uh, likely a short-term solution and a longer-term solution, and I'll, I'll let Kirsten elaborate upon that a little bit, but this would also be an item that we could potentially be bringing to the fall town meeting. Great. Uh, thanks, Jeff. So, yes, for anyone listening at home that's not familiar with what PFAS is, I think the Water Department's website has some good information on there, so uh, I'm, I'm not going to even touch upon what it is, except that it is a contamination issue that, you know, you didn't create, but you're having to deal with like dozens of communities across Massachusetts. Um, you know, it's a chemical that has gotten into a lot of the water supply and, you know, needs to be removed. Um, so fortunately, uh, again, the federal government and the infrastructure bill funding is flowing um, specifically money earmarked for PFAS and emerging contamination to the state SRF. So that is sort of a once a, 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 you know, a very big opportunity to access funding to deal with this issue. Um, so I'll just give a really quick couple of background slides, um, response actions to date that the town has taken to deal with the PFAS problem, and then the recommendations and next steps for restoring supplies. And again, we're recommending some parallel paths here, and I'll talk briefly about each one, uh, the reactivation of well nine, um, well four and five, a package treatment system, which is the subject of the SRF application we'd like to get an approval on tonight. Um, and then a preliminary de design for a future more centralized plant. So um, just really briefly for you know, the uh, benefit of the public, Yarmouth has 24 wells. Um, detections in wells four, five, and 10 have been found above the regulatory limit of 20 nanograms per liter back in 2021. And those wells were taken offline once the problem was discovered. So those wells are offline. Uh, levels in well not 18 have been detected at one point close to 20. So there's some concern 
on other wells too. At the same time, um, the federal government is indicating a possibility of lowering um, uh, regulatory limits. So that may be coming in the next few years. So I think it's important to, to not only address the current problem, plan ahead for potential additional treatment needs. Um, looking at your supply versus demand. Um, so unfortunately, supply has been decreasing with this problem as demand has increased. You can see the red line showing the supply as various wells have had to be taken offline over the years. Um, demand has gone up in, in the last couple of years as it was down last year. Um, but you know you can see where the red line meets the blue line. Uh, that's that's a big concern. And what that the only reason that you've been able to meet demand is by over pumping some of the other wells over the permit limit. And that's not really a sustainable solution. Um, so current supply um, is uh, about 9.7 in 2020, you hit 10.7 as I showed you on the diagram. So really it's about investing to restore supply resiliency. The minimum best practice that you that should be achieving is to meet your maximum day with largest source offline. Okay, so um, what's been done today, again, I mentioned the taking those wells offline, four, five, and 10. Um, and then we immediately started working with Lori and Jeff um, and the water team on preparing a corrective action, action plan for peace cost contamination. Um, and the following recommendations from that plan have already been implemented. And that is looking at a feasibility of interconnections with other towns, uh, water supply as a near term solution, um, prepared a water conservation plan. And then I know you all adopted that new policy and summer use restrictions for this summer which is important. Oh, we've also been preparing a draft uh, drought management plan. The draft is in process. And then um, really in blue, those two that I wanna talk about in a little more detail, the feasibility of reactivating well nine was looked into and the feasibility of treatment for wells four and five. So well nine, um, this was a well that was had to be taken offline back in 2013 um, and had an exceedance for um, PCE, which is a volatile, con volatile organic contaminant, and essentially was just left out of service uh, since that time. It is actually your largest source um, from a supply capacity standpoint. So, um, and, and we did have some monitoring wells installed over the past few years, and we've been monitoring the groundwater near the well, but it wasn't pumping. Um, but six, seven, and eight, which are right nearby, had been showing up as non-detect for PFAS. So that looked like it might be possible that whatever had passed by the volatile organics might be gone. So Lori and her team did some initial, initial testing just to get a, a snapshot of what the well's uh, like right now. And there was no contamination detected, which is a great sign. So um, the next steps would be to submit a formal proposal to DEP to reactivate the well. And we can do that pretty quickly. We're already started working on that. Um, then we need to conduct a few, several days of pumping tests, additional water quality samples, just more comprehensive sampling, and then submit a report to DEP. We can probably do that in January, we think. Um, the facility needs a little bit of upgrading from over the years, not having been used. And um, so that's, that's fairly minor. Um, and then um, the, the well should be able to be online for next summer, assuming the testing comes out uh, properly and DEP approves it. So this seems to be a really straightforward um, approach to address some of the supply issues. The next part of it is what we'd recommend um, is wells four and five, um, a package treatment unit. You know, we looked at other potential options, um, but this is really the only feasible option we think to give you a chance to get this back online, this get this source line for next summer. Um, what this would be is basically like a shipping container. This one that's shown in this example picture is a little more outfitted and it's clearly in a flooded area because it's got up on, on stilts. So that this is a little more elaborate than what we would envision. Um, but um, these things, instead of having a centralized facility that's got a full size building on it, which would take several years, um, these things, we've been talking to the vendors frequently. They have about a six month lead time. You know, they're not cheap, but they can get them on site um, by spring and get them installed and up and running. Um, there's the disadvantages to this solution, I would say, is that it 
it needs a bigger footprint because they're so short. You know, typically to treat PFAS, you have um, a fairly tall vessel. Um, um, over in Hyannis, they've got carbon vessels there, you know, they're 16 feet tall. Um, we've, in Millis, we've just designed a plant that this is very similar. So when you have these smaller units, uh, the sh vessels are shorter, so you need multiple shipping containers. Um, we've been pricing these out. I have asterisks next to those prices as um, CDM Smith <laughs> indicated, pricing is quite volatile and we're trying to narrow that down and be conservative enough. Um, but in addition to the four uh, shipping containers or pods, they call them, you would need um, four of those. You would need to put in um, clear trees, uh, put in concrete, pa concrete pads to, to sit there, situate those on. There need to be uh, dug out a small lagoon so that the filters could be backwashed when they start getting clogged up. Um, oh, I forgot to mention. So wells four and five also have iron and manganese. So in addition to the PFAS, you need to remove, there's two sets of filtration types to remove the, that before um, the PFAS resin, because then it will clog up the filters if you don't. Um, we need to be fencing, probably a booster pump. So all of that kind of goes into this estimated cost that we have there that we're working to finalize. Um, and what we would recommend is the next steps, submit that SRF application um, by the 12th. Um, there is subsidy available, as I mentioned, um, and also DEP is expediting this. So what we would recommend is um, an emergency pre-procurement approach. Uh, we believe that this would qualify for that. And that would mean the town would pre-procure the units um, right after town, fall town meeting so that they would be available by that six month lead time. So you would need to appropriate that full project cost at the fall town meeting. Um, you know, we'd be working to design, specify those treatment units so that you can pre-procure them, working on permitting over the fall. And then over the winter, designing the site improvements, the concrete pad, um, fencing, uh, grading, that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, it's a tight timeline, but we think that it would work. And we know from talking to DEP that you, and from working through the PEF application that the scoring would be extremely high. So um, lastly, another recommendation to address the, the problem holistically in parallel would be considering a centralized permanent treatment facility. I've shown well 10 and 11 site here on here, but I'm not convinced that's gonna be the final location of where that would be. I think there needs to be a little bit more thought put into it, possibly by well 18. Um, so, you know, what we'd recommend here is really to fund a preliminary design phase um, at Fall Town Meeting. Um, and then potentially uh, you could apply for SRF funding for detailed design. So that's another new PFAS related grant program uh, that they're gonna be offering. And then uh, move into detailed design in the summer so this process would probably take several years and looking at like a 25, 2025 plant timeline. But so what we're suggesting here is just thinking about funding the preliminary design phase at the fall town meeting. But there's no um, real ask on this one tonight for a vote. So I think that's the last slide on this. Just so just to summarize the, the plan that uh, Kirsten just identified was uh, a plan to bring three of the four wells back online for next summer. Uh, we feel that's uh, going to position us in a much better situation than we are this summer with the four offline, especially if uh, we're successful with nine, our biggest uh, supply that should really boost us up in our production and, and issues we have with uh, uh, supply currently. So that's the plan that we're presenting. Um, we have more detail, as I mentioned before, with the other applications as we lead up to town meeting and as it becomes as the process evolves and the plans develop a little further, but this is really the first step to get it in that SRF uh, process. And there's also significant subsidies associated with these projects. So it's, it's makes a lot of sense in order to get some state and federal subsidies to, to enter this process now. So happy to answer any questions you might have about this. Mark. Uh, no, I think this is a, a well thought through game plan for us. Um, but before I ask specific questions, I'm just curious, 
Uh, I noticed tonight in the news that the town of Harwich is adopting even further restrictions in terms of water conservation. I just wanted to take a moment while Laurie's here is to make, is there an, do you have an initial report on how our water conservation program is working? Do we need to do more? Uh, we may, we may need to. Um, our demands continue to go up through July as opposed to going down since we've enacted tighter restrictions. Um, and that being, we're getting through, I think the entire month we've had, except for yesterday, we've had no rain. Um, so people are watering more to try and keep that hay green. <laughs> um, so I think that's what's happening. So it's potential we could use um, some tighter restrictions um, going forward. Uh, just So the situation is not getting better? No. Okay, I think that's important, yeah. Which makes it even more urgent that we take uh, the recommendations that are outlined uh, in in this memo tonight. So uh, I'm, I'm prepared to make a motion, Mr. Chairman, if you'd like, or if you want to wait on that until we get. Why don't you hold that, okay. and I'll come back to you. Okay. Um, Dan, do you have anything? Um, just I'm curious. PFAFs are showing up everywhere now. Do we have any idea of how many other wells uh, potentially can uh, begin to show positive here? Well, I mean, the concern would be that well, 10 and 11 are close to close together, um, that 11 might be the next one. Okay. Same thing with 18 and 19. Um, those are the ones I would worry about. I don't know. Do yeah, yeah, that? those, um, well, 10 is slowly creep, uh, not 10, 11, which is just south of 10 up on the map there. 11 is slowly creeping up. It just hit 10 parts, parts per trillion. The limit is 20, so we're still good, but that one has been creeping up a little bit. 18's actually gone down in the most recent samples, but they kind of go, that one's kind of up and down on us. Um, four and five have remained pretty consistent. 10 has gone way up since we turned it off. Um, so it's kind of hard to tell. We Candidly, this is frightening. Yeah. Um, you know, we're, we're experiencing drought conditions, we're experiencing wells being shut down because of pollution, and we've got all this other stuff going on with wastewater and everything. It's just, it's really overwhelming what we're dealing with here. Um, on the conservation, um, do, is there any way that we can uh, tighten that up uh, to get more compliance? Because I know when I go walking, everybody's still watering, and I find it frankly annoying that people are ignoring the, um, directives from the town. Is there anything that we can do to reverse that? I think more, just more education is the way to get more compliance. I think a lot of people maybe don't, somehow don't know about it still. I know I've talked to some people. A lot of people don't have landlines anymore. Right. They've talked to their neighbors and their neighbors like, oh, I didn't know that. So, right. you know, they've complied once they know about it. So. Is there a mailing that's intended? Um, I was thinking about potentially sending a postcard to everyone in town. Um, I was just starting to look into that as a potential option because um, we do we try and get it out in every way possible but right. some people just aren't on the you've done a good job I've seen it in any number of areas it's yeah. it's just that yeah. compliance is, has been not what we hoped it would be right and I've had some suggestions of trying to get it on the radio maybe in the newspaper um, although I had I did hear it on the radio yeah. um, on some of the Cape stations so that's helpful. We didn't actually ask them to do that. They just did that on their own. So that's helpful. Um, so more of just getting the word out, I think is our best bet. Um, some people will just always um, be against, against it, but I think others, if they learn why, understand the importance of the conservation measures, they might be more willing to participate in the measures. Okay. Thank you very much. Dorcas. Um, no, I, I don't have any questions. Thank Peter. you. Um, the three to five, the three to five million is is your best guesstimate right now. Uh, I would say I'd have more confidence in saying that in a week. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, but but that's why I'm giving you a right. range, and it's got a a pretty big contingency in, right. in it. Um, it. Any any thoughts of Uncle Sam or our good friends at the State House giving some of that money back to us, or or that's our, that's our nickel. Yeah, no, there's definitely a subsidy, uh, the federal subsidy, and this is pretty new, so the state is still working out the details of how it's going to roll out, but there should be some principal forgiveness. And, 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 the, yes. and the, the, temp, the temporary solution, which, are, which are, you know, your, your buildings, your, um, 
Are they good for five years, 10 years? You know, I think that um, the options that we've cost out can actually probably function for a while. Um, you know, we're talking to the vendors. Some some systems are using these as sort of semi-permanent. Um, so it kind of depends. Right. I think they do have some flexibility in that if you wanted to move them to another site, theoretically, in future years, you could do that. It's not like you could just pull a tractor trailer up and haul them over and right. plug them in. But but they, they should be pretty um, pretty solid for a number of years. Right, and to piggyback on that, there's actually some systems that are taking these temporary units and taking the filters out and using them in the permanent installation. So really it's more of a maintenance, changing the media type of thing. It, there are good systems. And as Kirsten just mentioned, as we see it pop up, uh, PFAS pop up uh, in other uh, wells, we could potentially move the temporary solution around. Right. So yeah. it is a, uh, a good right. solution for at the moment. Right, and and, and on, on an in, annual maintenance basis, are there any estimates of, of those costs yet? Um, I, yeah, I wouldn't be prepared to give you something right now. I just, um, I would say in probably in the hundreds of thousands of dollars range, maybe low hundred. It just I, depends I, I, on the concentration, but right, yeah, I would, I, I would, I would assume eventually the the filters clog and yes. are become no good anymore. They can't right. be cleaned anymore, and that kind of stuff. Right. Okay, and I'm I'm assuming there's a fair amount of electricity to run all the pumps and stuff to to keep these things going. Yes. Okay. Um. Again, again, it has to be done. We have have to keep our water water clean and and keep our keep our public healthy. Thank you again. Thank you for your answers. Again, as Mark um, says, very succinct. In terms of the permanent solution <clears throat> on this, how how what, what's the scope of that project? And I, I I know you probably can't give any you know financial estimate with any high degree of accuracy. But what kind of money are we talking for a yeah. permanent solution? Um, well, the plant we just designed for Millis is going is only for two wells, and that's about one point five million gallons per day. Um, I'll just give you this as an example of a recent project. Um, bids on that range from 5.2 million to 8 million. So the swing in pricing is just insane. I've never seen, seen it like that. But anyway, so that one was 5.2. So what we'd be looking at here is to have a facility that would treat probably something like four wells, three or four wells. Three or four. So, you know, I really, it, it's going to be more than 10 million you know you might be talking more like 15 or more it's hard to say right now it's still 15, very early in the 15? process yeah. is that the number 15 roughly? something you know somewhere 10, on there more than more than 10 more than 10, 10, more than 10 20. <laughs> and that's than all 20, i can say 15 sounds good it's in the middle and, and is that this roughly anticipated schedule that it would take till around 2025 to have that in place yeah I think that's that's a pretty tight schedule. I mean, I think that's a pretty aggressive schedule, but that's what I would okay. say. For yeah. a no, no, just a broader question, and I talked to Bob Rittenauer about this a little bit. Is the source of this basically coming from septic systems, this PFAS, or is it coming from the water flow from the Sagamore lens and the Monomoy lens? Are we getting contribution from from other places outside the town? I think that there's a possible combination of sources. I think septic systems is a very likely contributor. Um, you can see that the highest levels are in the most densely populated, you know, areas around four and five, for example. But you know, PFAS has been found in rainfall. It's been found in fertilizers, you know, household products. It, it's so it, it's really hard to pin that down. Um, I don't know if you saw that. I believe in June, Attorney General Healy um, announced she's suing the manufacturers. So, you know, I don't know what that what's going to come of that, but at least that's something that the state is um, working to go after manufacturers of, of that. Um, there may be some future subsidy there, but well, you expect <clears throat> our wastewater plan generally to, in and of itself, to result in a substantial decrease in PFAS contamination. Or not necessarily so. Um, well, I, I can't really comment on. I'm not sure the specifics of that future design. Um, in theory, it should 
pick up the septic system, discharge, centralize it, and treat it to remove that. Yeah, I can piggyback on that. You'd, you'd have to take this area and all the around all the wells that are showing PFAS contamination offline and, and put them into the sewer system. And our current plan is a 40 year plan. So, you know, it, it would, in my opinion, have some success, but it's a lengthy plan to get there to take the septic systems offline. And those probably, those areas might not be necessarily in the higher priority areas, correct? That's correct. They're more towards the center of uh, Yarmouth and we're kind of starting mm -hmm. along that phase once the, uh, our backbone that we're calling it's along Route 28 and then areas off of that, it would take time to build the system out into some of the areas where we're having concern. Mm -hmm. Okay, do you need a motion on this? Yes, like yeah. the other ones, I'd suggest we should have a, a motion. The other motion. Yes, I do. Um, I, I'd like to also point out that, um, you know, I think your, your, your comment, Mr. Chairman, and your question is, is an excellent one because the good thing about our wastewater management plan is it's adaptable to changing conditions. We may very well find that there's an air, as time unfolds and monitoring continues, we may actually find that there's an area of the community where we're far more certain that it's the septic systems, that there isn't a point source, or we may find that there is, are a couple of point sources. And once we can target, we may, we may want to, with better information, target some areas. So, and that that's the advantage of having a system that's adaptable, that can be changed. You may decide as water commissioners and sewer commissioners, we may decide that some of these phases we might wanna tweak. We may find that as um, efforts to address contamination in our ponds, as we learn more about what's happening with our ponds. I know there's a Cape Cod Commission initiative that's been launched to investigate that. We may find that some of our ponds we might wanna prioritize. So I'm excited about, I, I, I'm, I think that's the, the genius of our wastewater plan is it, it's adaptable. We can make changes as conditions change. So, um, so with respect to this item, I'd like to uh, move that we authorize uh, the town administrator working with the DPW to um, submit uh, an SRF application or an application for any other federal and state funds uh, to implement measures to remediate PFAS contamination in wells four and five in concert with the, uh, the plan that was presented to the board tonight um, at our August 2nd meeting. And to authorize our town administrator to execute any and all appropriate documents. Agreed, yes. Okay. We have a second. Second. All right. Any discussion before we vote, Peter? Um, I, I believe to get the temporary stuff done, that has to go to town meeting. So, so we're well, just- Well, actually, if I can respond to that, no, the, I think the goal here is to tee this up for town meeting, but apply for the funds. So apply for the funds now. It may very well be that at the end of the day, what we may need from town meeting may be very little. Um, my hope is, is what they're proposing for us is a two track approach. Go directly for the grant funds, wherever they're coming from. Because the reality is, is that the feds and the state are putting more money into addressing drinking water and PFAS. And, and there are actually several pots of money that have been created to do this. So we need to rely on our team to go after every bucket of money that might be out there in order to address this. It's unclear when this window of opportunity is going to close. So let's do that. I like the approach of going after the grant money first. If it's not there or we don't succeed, we can, and I think we should be prepared to go to town meeting if in the event we don't succeed. Well, I, I guess I would just clarify that um, like the others, it would be a reimbursement um, loan or grant with principal forgiveness. So, so there has to be an appropriation the and then a reimbursement. Right. There would be. Yeah, okay. Right, but the only way to do that is to authorize going after all this money now, which is what line up the mm -hmm. exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, yeah okay. so there's, there's no question there'll be. All the money is. And yeah. as Mark points out, with these levels of contamination, whether you get reimbursement or not, you can't turn a blind eye to it. Exactly. This is kind of an emergency this situation, is, really. This, this is the this is the world we're in right now, and it's changed relatively quickly, but uh, we've got to deal with it. 
Um, so that's my motion. I have a second motion on the well number nine, but I just right, let's assume... vote this one. Did anybody else before we vote this one? No. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? That passes unanimously. Let's go to Route 6A Water Main Project. Well, well mi check. no, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make another motion regarding well nine that we authorize the town oh, administrator okay. working right. with DPW yep. to seek approval to DEP to reactive for from DEP to reactivate well nine. Any that, discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you, Mark, for picking that up. Route 6A Water Main Project is next. Thank you all. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. This this differs from the other four in that we've already received funding for this from town meeting. But in talking about these SRF applications, our finance director suggested that we apply this one as well through the SRF program. Uh, in the hopes that we could get uh, potentially the low interest loans or potentially even some uh, subsidies associated with it. Uh, as I mentioned before, for the other water main project, which was number two on your list, uh, water main projects in themselves don't tend to score terribly high, but we might as well try is, is certainly the thought here. Uh, and, and as I mentioned before, even if we just get the low interest loans in it, it's better than what the town could do on the market. That would be uh, certainly favorable. And so this project has already been approved at the uh, spring town meeting for $3.8 million. Uh, but because the SRF uh, program only has applications every August once a year, uh, this would be the time for, for this particular application. Mm -hmm. And uh, what you see on the screen is the extent of that uh, Route 6A water main project. So happy to answer any questions you might have, but this one's uh, relatively Mr. straightforward. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to move that we authorize the town administrator in conjunction with the DPW staff to apply for SRF funds to uh, undertake the work um, on Route 6A, the, the Route 6A water main project as presented. Second. Okay, and again, town administrator be authorized to sign any and all appropriate documents. Uh, agreed, yes. Yes, second. Yes, second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? So that passes unanimously as well. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you everybody. It's a historic step for water quality improvement in Yarmouth, I mean, um, very much. Discussion and approval of locations for the roadway banner project is next. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Kyle Pedicini. I'm the economic development coordinator. I'm here to present the application to install nine roadway banners at two different locations in Yarmouth. Uh, so these would be installed at the four poles on the Parker's River Bridge, the new bridge there. Um, and then they would also be installed along Route 28 in front of Town Hall. Um, so in your packet, there is a diagram that shows exactly where they're going and pictures of the Parker's River Bridge. Um, you can also see the designs of the, uh, the banners. Um, the ones going on Parker's River Bridge will use hardware that's designed for high winds since that's going to be over the water. So that was a concern. Um, this project is funded through the Town of Yarmouth's Tourism Re Revenue Preservation Fund allocated by the uh, Community and Economic Development Committee. Uh, so they endorse this project um, and they're technically the ones presenting it tonight. Uh, on, I'm presenting it on their behalf. Um, and we also got approval from Eversource for the, uh, the poles that we're hanging them on. Um, we didn't need them for the ones on Parker's River Bridge because the town owns those poles. Um, we were originally planning on also trying to install some roadway banners in the uh, Route 6A Village Center area as a part of those proposed upgrades, uh, but Old Kings Highway Historic District Committee uh, did not feel they were appropriate for the area, so that application was was not approved. Um, but uh, I would also like to point out that the banners going in front of the Town Hall area will be honoring our veterans, which we know is important to the Yarmouth community um, and was actually suggested by past uh, selectman Tracy Post. So um, we thank her for her guidance on that. Um, happy to answer any questions. Um, one question that I had, Kyle, on this is, are all these installations going to be done by the town of Yarmouth as opposed to any outside groups? It'll be an outside contractor doing the installation. An outside contractor? Yeah, it won't be the Department of Public Works. We're going to have to hire a a local sign company in all likelihood to, to do the installation. Okay, because if that's the case, 
we're probably going to have to get some kind of a hold harmless agreement from the from the contractor. So if there's any damage that's done to any third parties as a result of the installation, it's not not a liability on the part of the town. Sure. Yeah, we can uh, look into that. We did have a uh, a contractor install it. I should have mentioned we. And the other question is, who would maintain it? Who would maintain it? Who would check on it to make sure this installation is intact? Who would do that? That's that's us. That's town staff. Actually, the Chamber of Commerce helps us maintain those too. Um, we have some existing banners in two locations. So the, town, so the town could have some responsibility then if they're if they're the ones that are going to maintain it. Yeah, you'd know better than I with your legal background. Um, I mean, you, people that maintain it have to do it in a safe manner. I mean, that's yep. that's the fundamental premise of negligence law. Yep, absolutely. The only reason I'm asking you is with respect to the policy, you know, whether it, it covers those, those questions or not. Um, but I'm going to go to the board first. Mark? I have no questions. Dan? No questions. Dorcas? How would, would these, um, we have in our packet pictures of what the banners are going to look like. Yep. Would this be um, posted on the town website so people could see? Sure, sure, we can do that, yeah. Like? And then what was you say, nine total? What's nine total, yep, four on the Parkers River Bridge, five in the uh, Route, Route 28 area. And I, I forgot to point out, we do actually have some existing banners in town. Um, funded through the same fund previously that are along uh, the Four Corners area around the Bass River Bridge and around the Chamber of Commerce Recreation Building. Um, so we're kind of using the same process that we used. And are these, are these going to be seasonal? No, they'd be up year round. They would? Yep. Okay. I'm not actually, I'm not totally sure about the Parker's River Bridge ones if we'd need to take those down um, due to conditions over the bridge, but the intention is for them to be year round. You have anything else, Dorcas? No. Uh, Peter, the the ones that on Bridge Street are very nice. So this this will be a nice addition. Thank you. Okay, somebody prepared to make a motion then. Motion motion to approve the banners as presented in the in the uh, in the uh, um, right, policy. Second. 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 And. Um, Bob, you said we already got the approvals from Eversource. Eversource. Yes. And that there's a license that they've given us that's in your packet. The license is in there? Correct. I didn't see that. It's right after the is that a separate? banners. Oh. Oh, no, that's it. It doesn't look like it's in your packet. Oh, it doesn't look like it's in mine. Okay, I see it. Signed off by Instar Electric in April, April 25th. Thank you, Darkus. All right, we ready to vote on this? Yes. I'm sorry. Just one question. Yeah, good idea. I'm, I was looking for it. What is the cost of this? Uh, so the CEDC budgeted ten thousand dollars for the project. That was going to include the ones on Route Six A. So it'll be less than that. Less than that. Okay. Thank you. How many were you going to put up on Six A? Uh, I was going to be five there. Five. Yeah. Yeah. So it'll be significantly less than ten grand, probably. Yep. Mr. Right. Chairman, I got a follow-up question on the right. um, on the Six A. There were you said there were five that were Correct. proposed. Yeah. What was the reason for the objection? uh they didn't find it just overall they didn't find it appropriate for the area some people had concerns about that there was already too much signage in the area and adding more banners was going to confuse drivers of the air in the area um but overall they didn't they just didn't find it appropriate i think they would have rather had seen them on the kind of when you enter yarmouth port route 6a areas they wanted them on uh uh, like Union Street and uh, Willow Street kind of thing instead. So the disagreement was over the location? More or less, yes. And they also didn't like the design of the banners as well. So w is the plan to work with them on a better design? I mean, there are other historic districts that have banners. Sure, yeah. It's yeah. very common for a historic district to have a banner. Yep, yep. Um, usually what has to happen is the banner gets worked out with the commission and the staff. Has there been any thought given well, they to really try to... You know, they really didn't 
didn't seem amenable to the village center area, which I know when we met as a group uh, previously, that was really our intention of the project. Um, so we can, you know, try to go back to the drawing board, certainly. Um, but uh, it, certainly the sentiment from Old King's Highway was that they were not amenable to them in the village center area. But the idea of the banners, as I understood it, was to serve some purpose beyond just note of informing people. I mean, it was to try to make people aware that they're entering an area that they there's some activity and yep. people need to slow down. Yep. Right. That was I certainly tried to get that point across during. But that hearing. didn't work. Yeah. Um, you know, I I think as an agenda item, maybe I don't want to take up too much time, Mr. Chairman, but I'm I'm very open to discussing an appeal and uh, pursuing this issue. Um, it again, the banners can be designed in a way to reflect, but that doesn't seem to be, although the big issue. The biggest issue was the actual location of the banners. Right. The so, yeah, yeah I, I think it's again we we spent a lot of time working on a plan to help slow down traffic and do a whole host of other things on 6A. And I know this is a group that really hasn't been connected to any of that. Yep. And it may very well be that maybe we appeal the decision and work up some uh, new designs. I just don't want to abandon an effort. We spent a lot of time focused on 6A in this area and I think that it's worth um, an, another shot. Um, like I said, I've been in historic districts before. They're loaded with banners. They let everybody know that you're going to a special part of a community. Right. And sometimes the banners are draped in historic language, like right. welcome to historic Yarmouth port or welcome to historic that's, Lowell. That's exactly what the banners said. We're, we're going to say welcome to historic Yarmouth port. Yeah. <laughs> so, I don't, yeah, so, you know, I, I, I think it's, you know, if well, I'm in favor of appealing it and moving forward on it. We don't have to talk about that tonight, but um, I'm worth it coming up as another agenda item. Maybe we talk it about- I put it on the agenda as well. You would as well? Yes, absolutely. Mr. Horgan? I'm not adverse to that. Yeah. No, because I do believe there was a public safety component to this. Yep, yep. That was very legitimate. And all of the stakeholders seemed, at least most of them seemed to think right. made sense. And we do have the permission from Eversource for those locations. And yeah, well, I think it's worth appealing. So, um, I'm at. all right. So we have a we have a motion and a second, right? Yes. So all those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So that passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Um. Next item: approval of marketing, visitor services, and event coordination contract. That's with uh, the chamber. Yep. Oh, you you again, Kyle? Yeah, so still, 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 Kyle <laughs> Bennett, senior economic development coordinator. Uh, I believe there's a, a memo in your packet um, that indicates that we're looking uh, for approval of the uh, you know, the next contract with the uh, the Chamber of Commerce for marketing, visitor services, and event coordination for the town of Yarmouth. Uh, I'd like to note that this this contract was competitively procured through a request for proposal process. The town did receive. Uh, two proposals uh, for the uh, in, re in response to the RFP and a evaluation com committee of myself, Karen Green, Director of Community Development, who I actually believe is on the call tonight, um, uh, Svetlana Salem, and two members of the CEDC, Maria Morasco and Stephen O'Neill, the chairman, evaluated the proposals and determined that the Chamber of Commerce was the most highly advantageous from the town's perspective. Um, so the total amount of the contract is 165 thousand four hundred forty nine dollars and ninety six cents um, so happy to answer any questions and and also um, so there was an RFP and only two responses correct and right. out of the two the committee that you just mentioned evaluated both and thought that the chambers was more advantageous correct all right so we'll go to questions to the board mark um, I know in the past we've had a couple of people have raised questions about uh, this particular matter yep. and a potential conflict of interest. Did we get anything from town council suggesting or any legal opinion indicating that, you know, many, many communities when they have contracts signed, they get approved by town council and they address all these issues. Did we have town council look at this or render an opinion on that conflict of interest question? Cause it's come up at board meetings and it's come up at town meetings. Right. Right. Well, if I can briefly remark on that, I don't know if this, addresses the specific conflict or not, but 
in the past, I believe that the chamber's executive director sat on the CEDC committee, which awards or is involved in the awarding of the contract, mm -hmm. but that is no longer the case. Her appointment expired and she had written an email to us saying that um, she did not wish to be reappointed. So I, that's the only potential conflict of which I was aware, and that's been removed. Yep. Um, as a general rule, this is just my opinion, mm -hmm. and, my, and based on my understanding of the conflict laws, <clears throat> I think that anybody on the committee that represents an organization that is a potential recipient of funds from that committee Mm -hmm. at the very least should not be involved in that process. They should abstain or even better still should not be serving on the committee awarding the funds because under the conflict laws, there's that general catch all trap, so to speak, that says you must even avoid the mere appearance of a conflict of interest and the mere appearance of a conflict of interest is a conflict of interest. And if that ain't a trap, I don't know. I don't know what is because the ethics people will tell you what they feel is an appearance of a conflict of interest. And it might not be the same understanding that you have, but their perception is going to be the one that controls. So I'm not aware in this particular yeah. situation, and you correct me if I'm wrong, Kyle and, and Bob, I'm not aware of any potential conflicts. So I'm, I'm happy to approve it and and support it. I just would make the contingency subject to the approval of town council. Sure, That's absolutely. Fine. Which is normal for most contracts. Absolutely. So, in fact, if Dan, if there are no questions, I'm happy to make that motion. Questions, and we'll just, come back to Mark's motion. Just quickly, Kyle, could you just give us a general summation of why the chamber's proposal was superior to the other? Yeah, so the RFP was for marketing, visitor services, and event coordination. The Chamber of Commerce has a lot of experience doing exactly that. They specialize in those areas. Um, the other uh, proposal was more of a kind of communications-oriented kind of thing, writing press releases for the town and whatnot, and that wasn't the intention of the RFP. It was really to market the community, to try to bring in additional visitors to town, um, and the Chamber of Commerce's proposal was, was definitely superior in that regard. Dorcas? Uh, no, I have no questions. Um, just to commend the Chamber of Commerce on the work that they have done to this point. Thank you very much. I think, for instance, the addition of the February winter carnival was a great one. <laughs> Absolutely. It was cold. <laughs> it was cold. <laughs> now we'll continue to be funded through this contract. So. All right. Okay. Uh, Peter? Date commencing, dates ending. I don't see them in here. Yep, starts August. Well, it's supposed to start August 1st. Um, so it'll start just at the date it's signed and it runs through July uh, 31st. So it's a 12 month contract um, with the option to renew it for a total of 36 months. So the initial co initial contract is one, one year effectively. Yep. And, and then there's there's two op two more year options? Yep, Okay. Correct. At, at, at the same dollar amount each year? Or is there escal escalating amounts? Yeah, I think that would have to be um, rediscussed with the Chamber of Commerce. Um, there's usually, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't have an answer for that. It's okay. usually, yeah, I I'm, I'm not trying to put, put you on the, on the hot seat. I'm trying to think about how, how it worked last year, but I can't, I can't remember last uh, edition. Thanks, Kyle. Yep. And the, maintain, and the maintenance you said of the visitor center was a part of the RFP? Uh, the, the visitor center, as in the um, Chamber of Commerce building there, the one yeah. there, not, not, not the one off of Route 6. The one in the, in the building of the former police station. Correct. Yep. That's that was part of the RFP? Correct. Okay, because that, that's important, obviously. Yep, absolutely. Um, I, I notice on the signature page, Mark, there's a there's a number of people who are expected to sign off on this. Um, just
So did you want to make your motion? And uh, yeah, for the town, it was the department slash division head that says approved as to procurement, the chief procurement officer. Who's that? Our town account, you? The town, admi the town that's administrator. Not our, that's not our town accountant, that's Bob. Yes. Approval as to availability of funds, the town accountant, and contract approval, town administrator. So you'd be signing off, I guess, in two different capacities. Correct. Mm -hmm. Right. right. Mark, do you have a motion you want to make? Yeah, I move that uh, we approve the uh, marketing, visiting, visitor services, and event coordination uh, agreement um, that's been presented to us tonight. Uh, Penn provided it's uh, approved by town council. Do have a second? Second. Okay, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? So that passes unanimously. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you very much. Um, board and committee actions. Committee resignations, starting with Joe Baker from the Library Planning Committee. Then we have committee appointments. Committee reappointments. And then we have a motion on Will Rubenstein. And that'll take us through the next part of this numbers one through four. Go ahead, Dorcas. Okay. Um, we have received from um, Joe Baker that with regret uh, and due to his current workload that he is uh, no longer able to um, be a member of the library planning committee. Um, so that I would move that we accept his resignation. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So that carries unanimously. And a recommendation to appoint um, Liz Argo as a regular member to the Town of Yarmus Library Planning Committee. This appointment is for a three year unexpired term and will run through um, February of 20. Question on that one. It says 20, February 2024, but wouldn't it be if it's three years, February of 2025? Well, if she's oh no, I'm sorry, if that's right. In it, it was February. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yes, should trust that Pam knows what she's doing. So moved. <laughs> second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Anyone opposed? That recommend to generously. recommend to appoint um, to the personnel board, um, Ms. Gunther, as a regular member uh, to the Town of Yarmouth Personnel Board. This appointment is to fill an unexpired three-year term and will run through January of 2024. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? That passes unanimously. Recommendation to appoint Mr. Baker as the Town of Yarmouth representative to the Cape and Vineyard Electric Cooperative. This appointment is for a three-year term and will run through August 2025. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? It passes unanimously. Recommendation to appoint Dr. Clark as a regular member to the Town of Yarmouth Historical Commission. This appointment is for a three-year unexpired term and will run through July 2024. So moved. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Passes unanimously. Okay. Uh, recommendation to appoint Ms. Crowley as the planning board's representative to the Community Preservation Committee. This appointment is to fill an unexpired one-year term and will run through September 2022. Uh, I move to appoint Joanne Crowley to the uh, CPC committee. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? That passes unanimously. Okay, um, recommendation to appoint Ms. Hamilton as the Community Housing Committee's representative to the Community Preservation Committee. This appointment is for a one year term and will run through July of 2023. I move to appoint Lee Hamilton to the Community Preservation Committee. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Carries unanimously. Okay, and the next one, uh, Mr. Chairman, is in response to uh, previous discussions that we had uh, regarding Will Rubenstein. Mm -hmm. So it would be to amend the January 12, 2021 Board of Selectmen minutes to show that he stepped down as chair of the Library Pl Planning Committee only and a confirmatory vote to have him remain as Library Planning Committee member. So moved. Did, um, 
that covered by Yes, it does. And just to, to read for the record, the corrected motion um, for the January 21 Board of Selectmen 20, 2021 minutes is to accept Will Rubenstein's request to step down as chair of the Library Planning Committee, but to continue as a member. And we approve that's that. going to be reflected in the minutes of this meeting. In the minutes of this meeting and the, min the minutes of the January as, 12. As correcting the previous minutes. Um, yes, and, and, I, and I just want to state as, as well, um, you know, the, the office staff went back and reviewed the actual tapes of that meeting. And um, it, is, it is our belief that the motion that was just read to you was in fact the intended motion. It wasn't stated um, in full uh, voice, but it was referred to the attached letter that was submitted to the Board of Selectmen. And that was the, the motion I moved that um, as per the letter. And in the letter, it specifically states to step down as chair, but remain as a member of the committee. So that was the intention of the board we've determined. And, and so therefore the, the correction to those minutes is appropriate. Do you think that motion covers that? Or do you think we have to add what that suggested language? No, I, I think what? the language is, is fine to accept the request to step down as chair of the library planning committee, but to continue as a member. To be a member and that that correction be reflected in the January 12, 2021 minutes. Correct. And also be reflected in the minutes of this meeting. That is correct. Okay, can we add that to the motion? Sure. Absolutely. In the second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? That's done and that's corrected. And Will is in good stead now. <laughs> um, do we have anything else, Dorcas? No, Mr. Chairman, that'll That's do it. That's it for you? Okay, great. So now we come up to um, agenda review, I guess. Next meeting, as you know, a week from tonight will be interviews for the police chief um, exclusively. There'll be no other business unless some emergency matter comes up, which I doubt and I hope not. And please note the 5 p.m. start. 5 p.m. That'll be on August 9th. We will have a candidate every hour, I guess. We, you know, if we run over a little bit, we do, right? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna shut down anybody's questions or anything like that. It, but we're just approximating. It'll be a five, six, and seven time frame. Flip a coin and who's going first? Excuse me. We're gonna. We're going to flip a coin to see who's going oh, first. Yeah. Bob already has a proposed order, and um, the order will be in the reverse order in which the names appeared in the executive session. Oh, excellent. So will the candidates be secluded, the ones that are? That's, a, that's an excellent question. They should, yeah. They should be. We shouldn't have candidates. Interview can, you know, the, the, the second person getting interviewed should be Right. Well, we'll, we'll it's like the dating game, right? Yeah. Why can't we just bring them up to conference room A so. like we did with the um, town administrator? Didn't we do that when we interviewed the yep. TA yep. candidates? Yes. We'll, yep. we'll orchestrate that entire process. Yep. We put blindfolds on bring each the of the candidates <laughs> and we bring the wine and the, <laughs> <laughs> the cheese and stuff and just put it out in conference room A. There you go. <laughs> so, so we're all ready, or we will be. That would be an ethical question. Have any of you? <laughs> Have you listened? Yeah. Conducted surveillance on the previous interviews. <laughs> uh, it's going to be an interesting night. Yeah, because you can watch it on your phone. I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be fun. I do. Mm. I really do. It's going to be very interesting. I think you have three great candidates, and and we got a great consultant. I was very impressed with him. I think he did a nice job. I think he's engaged. I think he's listening to the board. He's getting taken a lot of input from the board. He's going to be of great service, I think, in this interview process. Yeah, he's a good chief, and you know, he's he's got a, a another partner who has got 
and additionally over 35 years as a as a chief and um they're they're funny they're they're totally different but both you know um former presidents of the massachusetts association of chiefs of police and you know right on the money with i was very impressed with that firm yeah i think he was very candid in his responses uh, you know he's the kind of guy that was very objective in his comments and he didn't know something or he didn't feel it, it, it was relevant particularly he told you that you know he was a pretty straightforward guy i i, I liked his candor um okay so agenda review what do we have coming up so on august 16 one item that's not listed um I, i'd like to add on there an update on the fire chief recruitment process we've made some significant progress there we also have some highly skilled technical assistance that's been um, working to help us assess the candidates and, and we'll have a report. And, and I think I, I'd like to see it um, mirror the same process that you, you did for the um, police chief uh, by having the consultant here and give a report on some of the assessment that we've done with the candidates. Um, That'd be great. For, that would be for, very for fire chief. And I, and I think that you'll enjoy that tremendously as, as well. Um, and we've got the tax rate classification hearing that evening. Um, there's also a, a bond signing and, uh, but, but I, I think, you know, that having the mass DOT here, we've been anxiously awaiting that. And um, I, I do want to say that, you know, I've spoken to their chief engineer on, on the project, Tom Currier, who I've worked with many times in the past, and he was actually um, very um, happy. He was, he was glad to be asked and um, the idea of coming down and having a, an update for both the board and, and local residents, um, you know, they jumped at that and he lined his consultants up. And so, so that's great. And we tentatively put up the um, police chief selection process on for the 16th. And, um, you know, that's pending what. Uh, do we have the, um, do we have the Mattakis uh, matter coming up on that night? Yes, we, we do. Because, um, we got a bill sent us a memo on that, right? Was that was that passed out tonight? Yes, yes, yes it was. You should have. A so memo. we'll 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 have actually two weeks to go through that, right? Correct. And get ready for that discussion, and uh, just make sure. I, I I did see it. It's in my pile somewhere, but I did see it on the desk earlier, and um, Bob did say that we were going to be getting something tonight. Um, so we'll have a chance to go through that. I encourage everybody to read that between now and two weeks from now. And that we'll put that on, right? We'll put that on. We have 16th. The 16th. This, uh, there was and the first then, one. This is the second one. Um, Anything else? Anybody? No. Well, stuff always comes up. I'm sure there'll be a few other items. Um, I, th I do think a note that we might want to, an agenda item that we might want to discuss later is something that Selectman McGurn raised, and that is the whole issue of accreditation and yeah, uh, accreditation. what that might involve and what that might entail. And uh, I just I think we should flag that for the administrator that at an appropriate time doesn't have to be urgent, but it's. Well, it I, might, I it might call in, in very vaguely some discussion about that earlier with uh, with the chief. It might have even been somebody else in the police department, but I remember that accreditation process was kind of brought up as a goal. Uh, I don't know why it didn't go forward. There might have been there might have been a financial component there that had to be worked out. I don't know. Yeah, I think it would be helpful to know what the requirements are and and what the financial component maybe might be. Maybe we can um, maybe we can talk to Chief Fredrickson before he leaves about that. Have him come in. It might be interesting too to have a discussion on a joint dispatch or at least begin the discussion. Um, <laughs> 
That's a, that's a, that's a. I know it's, it's been. Well, I think we'll, we'll probably be, dis yeah, we'll be discussing it during item. the interviews. I, I think we're going to have to get through the new chiefs before we go yeah, to and that I, issue. Yeah, but, I, and I don't think the issue should not, it should not come up. It, we should make sure it comes up on because both, even with, both chiefs. Even with right? two lame both duck, chiefs. even with two lame duck chiefs, you won't get it. Cause it's just, <laughs> no, I mean, on I, the way out. That they both want, they both feel they're the appropriate. Uh, we're going to have to make a decision. But, on but the point is, is let's get everybody on the record. Let's hear what they have to say. Yes, of course. Right? Yes. And the thing is, if we're interested, yeah, no, we'll, I think it's. We'll put that on the list of uh, not yeah. not for the 16th, but upcoming items. Yeah. Is um, dispatch right? Yeah. Well, that discussion is going to begin next week. Yes, it will. In part, yeah. I would assume it'll come out in the interviews. Yes. Um, I said too much already. Mr. Like that last day. Right. It's, it's, Mr. Chairman, go, going back to going back to next week, um, Bob, are you gonna are you gonna seat us with questions and stuff ahead of time? Mm. Yes. Oh yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Chief well, Stevens. He'll be here. He'll give us. Had copious notes from some of the the issues. He needed a little guidance to finalize it, and so we're gonna have um, some some questions for you. In, in advance. Yeah, and what would be good if he could at some point email us what he thinks the questions are going to be? Yeah, Just, as soon as he gets those, it might be tomorrow. I don't want to rush him. I don't want to put any undue pressure on him if it's convenient for him. If not, we've all been around. You know, we, we don't need a lot of prep to, to, to get this thing organized. It's nice to have you know, the, the leisurely time, but I want to do it around him. He's, uh, he's a really important component of his process. I want him to be comfortable with his time schedule and so forth. Um, now, that, that's another question. Uh, I would assume, or I, would, I shouldn't say I would assume, I, I think he's indicating that he made a statement that I think the board, everybody in the board should ask a question. Mm -hmm. I, I imply from that, that he's anticipating directing some questions himself. No, I didn't think so. I, I you don't think, think so. No, he, okay. he'll, cause I don't have a problem with that. Frankly, if, if he, if he wants to be a questioner as well as us, as long as they're neutral questions. I think, I think the expectation is for him to, trap questions for us okay that's fine that's fine but i think we may have questions for him yeah. as the proceedings unfold and i do think there may be an interest on the part of the board when we convene on let's assume that the 16th is a to, date to have him back yeah it may be part of that i mean i'm not suggesting we should i'm just suggesting the board may want to have him back if he's going to be returned when we're deliberating uh and and it, he may not need to be here in person you may want him just to stand by i'm just putting that out there so having him engaged because I mean, we talked about from the start to the finish so um yes as far as consultants go uh, in this process i think he adds a measure beyond what you would normally expect and i i think we're all kind of caught up with that and uh, impressed by him and um, look at him as a very valuable resource. Yeah, it's like when we when we went through the whole town administrator process in the past, we've had consultants. And uh, the last time we, I mean, we, we did it together and pretty much ourselves, but we had, you know, it wasn't that long ago that many of us. Yeah, I think we used the Collins Institute before that. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I, I would agree with you, Mr. Chairman. I think he's, he's a great consultant, a great advisor, and uh, yeah. I'm glad we have him. All right, any, anybody have anything else on the agenda? The only thing that I want to just mention on the agenda is I want to commend Bob in, in, in terms of the way in which this tonight's agenda was organized and getting all the water sewer stuff together. Oh, that was good. Yeah, and was. Um, I know it was necessary and it was timely, but... Um, I like the, I like the the thought of having regular meetings focused on water sewer issues. Um, we are water commissioners. We are the de facto sewer commissioners, and I think that this has been a problem prior to your 
arrival, and I think it's terrific that in that, like that this this agenda was organized where we have it here. Um, I'm I'm a believer that we need to keep water. You know, we talked about priorities at our at our um, this was at our summit meeting. Priority. Yeah, and this kept up all the time. So I think uh, I think it, it's helpful to sustain that, and uh, so I, I appreciate that. I I agree with you. I I think it was a very well organized. Uh, uh, presentation and um, very informative. There, there was a good number of consultants that were present. And not only that, house the and and um, and, and uh, they, by, by by contract. No, they they've given us. I was impressed with the advice and guidance by all our consultants. And I think too. I think water quality is becoming. I don't want to use an alarmist word, but it's headed towards a point of crisis if if action isn't taken. So having said that, now this is the segue into an agenda item that we might want to think about, and that is revisiting water and water conservation policy. Harwich, they just ratcheted up their conservation measures. Um, I think we have to at least make it as a footnote or put an asterisk by it until we get through. It's almost for every week. We may need to address this issue or we probably should get updated. Remember how we were getting regular updates on COVID every week? Yeah. There may be some value, right a water conservation update and staff should be prepared to answer a question from a board member about, do we need to ratchet things up? Um, like I said, I, I just read that they broadcast it tonight on the news. Harwich is, it's almost like you can't water your lawn almost any time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, my note to myself was, was drought and communication to the public. Cause I don't think there's been good, right. good communication and driving around town and I see lawn sprinklers on that are, that are very nicely watering the street just Listen. irks me to, yeah. to death. So can I make a suggestion on that? I, I know we're kind of in a stream of consciousness mode here, but it, these are all excellent points. Um, uh, with, with, with no disrespect to the individual involved in doing the alert on the water conservation policy, I will admit I could barely hear it. And then when my machine shut off, I only got a portion of it. Um, I'm not, it might be helpful to have the, I don't know if it's pro. I know sometimes the police chief will remind people that we have town meeting or we have other things going on. Um, there may be some value in having some another voice that can get your attention because this is serious. This is blank. He would, he would be the right one. Yes, and I want to make it abundantly clear we're facing a serious drought. We have a serious water, um, find the word, but Maybe the thing to do as an interim measure is to see if we can get him to get a community message out as to what the current policy is and then go from there. Yeah, I, th I honestly... Because you won't have to wait for two two more weeks. The other, the other thing is just the length of the message. I think it has to be brief. Yes. You know, and, and it may very well be we need all Yarmouth residents to reduce the amount of water consumption. Well, I think Bob can come up with a, with a message that he could get to the chief. Uh -huh. And, and, Hopefully and he'd be willing to do it. I don't. I'm sure I, he I would. don't. Of course he would. Mr. Scott, if I may, there's another method I've seen in some towns. You put sandwich board signs outside the grocery stores. Eventually, people go to one of them, and it has the detail with a website address. Not no King's Highway, I hope. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You might have to get approval yeah, on very the nice location. sandwich board out there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's stuff. my suggestion is that we have water conservation as a recurring item until kind of we can, you know, rel you know, we're over the crisis. Very appropriate. <laughs> or until it rains very heavily <laughs> for a very long time. Yeah. yeah. Anything else? Okay, let's move on. Um, this now we have individual items. I'm going to start with Peter. You have anything, Peter? I it, it, actually we we hit it hit it on on the drought, the drought information, and that it should be reoccurring in our meetings. Okay. Anything else, Peter? Uh, no, no. Marcus. 
Not at this time. Okay, Dan. No, thank you. Mark. I'm set. Thank you. I think we should comment just briefly. Um, we don't want to get into a lot of detail about our meeting that we had Saturday, last Saturday, with our board and a consultant um, and our town administrator, Bob Rittenauer, and our um, assistant town administrator, Bill. Um, and we talked about goals and we tried to kind of depart from what we had done in the past and, and, and get, get more succinct as to what the um, top priorities are that the Board of Selectmen wants the town to advance over the next year or so. Uh, and it was, I want to commend everybody that was involved because it was, it was on a Saturday morning where a lot of people, a hot day, a lot of people going to the beach and so forth. So all of us were at the um, former auditorium at the John Simpkins, the John Simpkins School. And we were there from about nine o'clock till 1230, one o'clock, somewhere in that range. And um, it was really a productive discussion, I thought. And it was really um, beneficial for the board to have a dialogue that, that wasn't interrupted by other business and was devoted solely to that issue. And we're gonna have, as a result of that, um some some goals that we're going to put in written form um for the public but wastewater not surprisingly was at the very top of the totem pole um not just wastewater clean water right. which involves wastewater and drinking water and all these other issues which coordinates well with what mark was talking about with regular updates on, on water quality issues and conservation issues and things like that, because after discussing all these things for several hours, that was a net result of, of, of uh, not, just, not just the board members, but our, our top administrative uh, officers in this town as well. So um, again, I, I wanna thank everybody for their participation in that and their sacrifice and giving up their Saturday morning to do this. I think it was very productive and, and I look forward to having those kind of discussions in the future at dedicated times that, that we are not distracted by any other town business. I think that was an excellent way to do it. And I, and I thank uh, Bob for all his hard work in organizing this and, and uh, getting the facility and, and the consultant who <laughs> who we had a problem getting because of a series of natural disasters with, with uh, snowstorms and, and COVID attacks and other things. So it was, uh, it was a nice, it was a nice and productive meeting, I thought. Um, so we'll go next to the consent agenda. We have donations for the Armouth Senior Center in the amount of seven hundred ninety dollars and fifty cents and to the town administrator's office in the amount of 100 for total donations of eight hundred and ninety dollars and fifty cents i move the consent agenda second okay all those in favor aye. aye anyone opposed that passes unanimously um and now we go to town administrator updates Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have been able to cover most of the items I wanted to bring up. Um, very honored to participate in the selectman's goal setting process. It was, um, it was impressive and we'll have the material. I've got the secret scrolls. They're all on the big sheets that we're <laughs> translating now back into. And, and so we'll, we'll have those for public review. Um, we talked sure. about that um, scope on, on the Matic keys, please review that. I thought Bill did a great job in laying out. Excellent. You know, we had a lot of issues that we discussed last week and uh, we, we felt it was important and, and Bill brought this up first to, to provide this information to you now so that 
we can review it and we'll be ready to discuss it. We you know, don't wanna just like spring that on you. It's kind of complicated. And we talked about our fire department. Um, Bill and I both attended a section of the One Cape meeting um, this morning for um, some of the municipal leaders the uh, Cape Cod Commission has their annual event that they try to gather the communities from the Cape to discuss you know, the, the issues of uh, critical importance. And I, I think it's particularly important that the town of Yarmouth you know, really does play a, a leadership role in some of these issues. And you know, we were able to touch bases with people like the Secretary for uh, Executive Office of Environmental Affairs and discuss with the um, chamber director briefly and our legislative delegation some of these issues and you know it, it was a meeting for everyone not just for us but I think it's particularly important to participate in these and to show that regional leadership um, so we we were down there I, I, another item I wanted to review with board members it's in your packet um, board members voted at the last meeting to establish the date of November 15, 2022 for a special town meeting. And what um, I've put together in order to make that happen, there's I don't know, or so all of the critical steps. So I prepared that calendar for you and we'll incorporate that into all of our calendars. The key oh, wow. thing, I need approval from the, the board of selectmen because I'd like to advertise it, uh, is that our deadline for the submission of special town meeting articles um, I proposed September 20, 2022. That allows us um, ample time to have people prepare for any articles they need to submit, but it gives us the time we need after that deadline to prepare all of the detailed review. And I think if we follow this calendar, we're going to hit all the steps and we're going to have a very smooth town meeting. So, um, unless there's any um, objection, I'm going to publish this calendar and then we'll, we'll keep it rolling and keep it following. And, and it's just how do we get from today to a town meeting and what do we have to do in the intervening time? And another thing I just wanted to make for awareness to make the, the board aware you see on our future agenda, we've got a, uh, you know, a bond issue and a signing coming up. Well, um, last week, our team here in town, we had a uh, a major bond rating meeting with Standard & Poor's bond rating company. And, um, you know, the town is absolutely poised at that double A plus. We're just one notch short, but triple A. And um, I'll tell you, I've, I've looked at the numbers. I've been through this process over and over. I think Yarmouth's numbers are very, very strong. And if it was just going by you know, our, our numbers locally, I, I think we would be a triple A. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of things that are going on in the, the world, the economy. Uh, we do have a major project. Everyone knows about the um, wastewater project that, that's coming up. And these all complicate it. But, I, you know, mostly I wanted to really salute our team, which um, Ed Sentio, our finance director, um, I, I thought did a, a great job. He is so locked into these these measures. And I personally felt I participated strongly as well. Um, a whole team, a whole team did. And, and I thought we represented the town extremely well. Whether we get the, the triple A or they want us to stay in limbo at the double A plus again, I just want to let you know that, that we're closing in on that triple A. And, um, you know, I, I think the town is going to be there, whether it's this one the next one, it's, it's, it's coming, and I think we look real strong. And I would think, Bob, that even these towns that are rated AAA, they're going to have to be facing this albatross of wastewater just like we are. I, I can't believe they're going to just automatically downgrade them because of that. I don't think that's our problem. I mean, I, I think... At least I, aren't there some county measures that go into that formula? The way it was characterized to me, and, I, and, I, and I'm anxious to hear Bob comment on this, but in the past, it's been related to some factors that are almost out of our control. Uh, correct. You know, dealing with uh, economics. Yes. And um, regional economics. Yeah. So I, I think at some point, it, am I missing well, something? No, I, I, the reason I'm smiling and, and, and he, he sees that is, is because you see, uh, our forte is the strength of the town's management. 
and we keep hammering that point over and over and, and it gets to the point the standard and poor's people say look you guys have the strongest town management that we've seen you're okay there but you know we have concerns about uh, economic issues their major concerns are really threefold the only things that are really out there right there are the economic issues that that we face as I think a nation right now has got everyone a little bit on edge. Um, there are concerns, you know, we do have unfunded liabilities, but you know, they're being managed very strongly. Yeah. Could you do me a favor, Bob, uh, is send the latest standard and pours rating sheet for Yarmouth to the board. Sure. That I think you need to read this stuff for yourself. Read, read the latest review. Um, and they're in the public domain. You can access them, but sometimes it gets a little tricky. But I think if you could provide that, that would be helpful. The actually standard and poor, I think they, it's their, they're, they're the ones that rate Yarmouth, or is right. it Moody? No, we're standard and poor. Standard and poor, they rave about the management of the town. Budgeting, management, financials. So the, the things that we have control over, uh, high marks. Uh, it's stuff that we don't have control over, and you're just going to have to read it, uh, you know, yourself. That's and then, my understanding from what Ed has said in the past. Yeah, it was what Mark. Yeah, was mentioning. And and Ed's an impressive advocate too, and I, I just uh, need to say that I, I was just so impressed with his performance and the way we, you know, we we worked as a as a team, and I and I think that was very evident to the um, folks on the call. And, and even our certifying bank agent, you know, um, you, you know, we, we go over what, what's you, your prognosis and she can't believe we're not a triple A that so, and, you know, so I, I, I think that, that we're doing better than a lot of communities that have received the triple A in the past and they just hold them there. But now, right. it, you know, it's tough to get them to upgrade, but, but we're certainly, we're doing really well and, and we'll have a new report to, to review, but I just want to make sure, you know, the board was aware of that process and the, the folks in this building, the folks that control your finances, you know, that's the thing I, I was most impressed about. They really care. They really care about the success, about about the town, and, and it's a matter of pride. And so I, I think that, you know, ultimately we're, we're going to be there and we'll see how it goes with, we, we might have a brand new report for you to look at um, this week. So that's all I have for tonight. Well, thank you. It's been a long night. Do I have a, a motion to adjourn? Mr. Chairman, yes. I move we adjourn. We have a second? second? I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We're adjourned.